Sergeant, uh, will you start your recording? Stop your recording started. Cloud recording started. Thank you. Sergeant Joan, will you give your opening statement? Yeah. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing on the Committee on Zoning and Franchise. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their videos? And to minimize disruption, please place electronic devices to vibrate or silent. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. And again, that is landusetestimony land at council.nyc.gov. And thank you for your cooperation. And Chair, we are ready to begin. Great, thank you. Good morning. I'm Council Member Francisco Moya, Chair of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. Uh, I am joined remotely today by Council Members uh, Barry Gradenchek, Ayala, Borelli, Reynoso, Rivera, Brannon, Yeager. Uh, to, to start, I would like to first note that the pre considered LUs 1718 uh, and 719 on today's agenda for the Cortel U Road rezoning are being uh, laid over. Today, we will vote on items heard by the subcommittee at our meetings of January 26th and February 9th, including LUs uh, 714 and 715 for the 42-11 9th Street Special Permit in Queens, pre-considered LUs 722 and 723 for the 16th Avenue rezoning in Brooklyn, pre-considered LUs 727 and 728 for the 9114 Fifth Avenue rezoning in Brooklyn, and pre-considered LUs uh, 729 for the 214-32 Hillside Avenue rezoning in Queens. We will also uh, hold public hearings on the 245-01 Jamaica Avenue rezoning, the 91-32 63rd Drive rezoning, and the uh, uh, R, oh my God, <laughs> the, uh, Arvernier uh, East rezoning and the proposal, which uh, all related and located in Queens, as well as the 737 uh, 4th Avenue rezoning, which is related to property located in Brooklyn. Um, we will also begin uh, with a vote to approve with modifications, uh, LUs numbers 714 and 715 for the 4211 9th Street special permit application relating to property in council member Van Bramer's district in Queens. The application was proposed, uh, which seeks a zoning text amendment and special permit pursuant to the amended text to include the project area into a new industrial business incentive area and to allow modification, modifications of various bulk and use uh, regulations, including floor area increases for certain industrial and incentive uses up to a maximum FAR of 6.5. The requested actions would facilitate the development of a new 21 story building with approximately 64,000 square feet of required industrial use, uh, 254,000 square feet of commercial use, and 3,000 square feet of ground floor retail. Uh, our modification will be uh, to include uh, to, to include annual third party reporting uh, requirements related to compliance for owners within the proposed incentive business incentive area two. Council member Van Bramer is in support of the proposal as modified. Uh, we will also vote to disapprove pre-considered uh, LU's number 722 and 723 for the 16th Avenue rezoning related to property in Borough Park neighborhood in council member Yeager's district in Brooklyn. The application uh, as proposed seeks a zoning map amendment to change an R5 and an R5 C22 district to a C4, C4A district and a related zoning text amendment to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area utilizing option uh, options one and two in order to facilitate the development of a five-story commercial office building. We have carefully considered the actions and have ultimately concluded that a disapproval is appropriate here. The zoning area is in a low density neighborhood dominated by uh, one to three story buildings. A C44A zoning district uh, in the commercial, it is the commercial equivalent of an R7A and permits, uh, and permits buildings of up to 95 feet, which is out of context with the well-established character of the surrounding area. 
This rezoning would also upzone and potentially induce displacement on uh, non-applicant controlled sites, including a residential building next to the proposed development site. Um, and also as uh, a religious and community uh, resource for the neighborhood, uh, both the community board and borough president noted the inappropriate height and bulk allowed by the proposed C4 for a district, as well as the detrimental traffic and parking impacts of a new commercial development. The applicant failed to adequately address these concerns throughout the public uh, review process. And so for all these reasons, we will recommend the disapproval. Uh, we will also vote to approve with modifications uh, pre-considered LU numbers 727 and 728 for the 9114 Fifth Avenue rezoning related in Council Member Brandon's district in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. The application was originally presented, seeks a zoning map amendment to change an existing uh, C82 district to a proposed uh, R7A C24 zoning district and a zoning text amendment to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area utilizing options one and two for the project site as well as for a larger rezoning area. These actions are intended to facilitate the development of a nine-story uh, 45,000 square foot mixed-use residential building with ground floor commercial use uh, uses and 41 units of housing on the project site which fronts on uh, a wide street. Uh, we have heard concerns from the community board and the borough president regarding the appropriateness of an R7A district mapped on three lots with two-story residential buildings on the corner of 4th Avenue and 92nd Street. Uh, R7A districts allow for a maximum FAR of 4.6 um, with MIH as well as commercial use up to a maximum FAR of 2.0 uh, within the contextual building envelope with a maximum height of 95 feet or nine stories. The proposed rezoning would bring uh, these non-conforming buildings into conformance, but would allow for higher density and height than is appropriate on this part of 92nd Street, a narrow street which currently uh, consists of two-story residential and three-story residential and mixed-use buildings on the north side of 92nd Street and a seven-story commercial building on the south side. Uh, for this reason, we are modifying the application uh, to apply the more moderate R6A zoning on those lots instead. The west side of 4th Avenue across uh, the street from these two-story buildings is currently mapped with an R6A uh, C23 zoning district, R6A zoning district permit, a maximum FAR of 3.0 for residential uses with a maximum base height of 65 feet and an overall maximum building height of 75 feet uh, above uh, a required setback. Uh, the more modest uh, R6A designation supports the goals of the Bay Ridge Special District. The goals of the Special District are to maintain the existing scale and character of the residential and commercial uh, community and encourage development, which is in character with the neighborhood by modifying the zoning map to step down to an R6A C24 towards uh, 4th Avenue. We would bring the non-conforming lots into conformance uh, and allow appropriate uh, height with density that matches the surrounding context. Uh, we are also modifying the proposed MIH zoning text amendment by allowing the workforce option in addition to options one and two. My colleague, uh, Council Member Brandon, is uh, here to speak more about these modifications. We will also vote to approve pre-considered LU 729 um, for the 214-32 Hillside Avenue rezoning related to property in Council Member Gredenchek's district in Queens. The application seeks a zoning map amendment to map a C23 uh, commercial overlay district in an existing R2 district to facilitate the development of a new two-story commercial building with five accessory parking spaces and one uh, loading berth. Council Member Gredenchek is in support of the proposal. Um, here, uh, I'm going to uh, pause for a moment to allow um, either Council Member uh, Gredenchek, uh, Brannon, uh, Yeager, uh, if they'd like to make any uh, comments uh, on their projects. If we could, we'll just go in order of just raise your hand who's going to speak. Thank you. Uh, I guess I'll start, Chair. Th I just want to say thank you 
uh, to the land use staff and to everybody who has uh, shepherded this small but significant rezoning in my district to this day. I wanna thank the chair for his courtesy and I am fully supportive as is the community of this proposal. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Barry. Anyone else? Councilmember Brennan? Yep. Hold on. There you go. Thank you. I couldn't I couldn't find the raise hand thing. Um, thank you, Chair Moya, uh, for the opportunity to speak today uh, and quickly express my support of this proposed rezoning. And of course, thank the members of the zoning subcommittee uh, for a chance to explain my reasoning. As Chair Moya explained in his introduction, this application will change the zoning map by mapping R6A and R7A districts on properties that are now mapped only for commercial use. Uh, the rezoning will facilitate the construction of a 41 unit mixed use residential building and will bring three nearby two story um, owner occupied residential buildings into compliance uh, by changing their zoning from commercial to residential. Uh, this rezoning will map uh, MIH over the entire rezoning area. When the subcommittee heard this application, it was asked to uh, approve MIH options one and two. Today, the subcommittee is, is being asked to add the workforce option as well. Uh, I understand that adding the workforce option may raise some concerns. I respect those concerns. Um, wanted to explain why this modification is before you today and quickly explain the history of the project. Uh, in 2018, uh, DOB approved the applicant's plans to build an as of right hotel in the CA2 district. The community expressed strong opposition to the project as a hotel in this location would be inappropriate, especially in a neighborhood in dire need of more schools and more affordable housing. Uh, I also objected to the construction of a hotel on this site. And so in partnership with the community board, I began a two year long process of negotiating and pushing the developer to propose an alternative plan that would meet the needs of the neighborhood and provide for a better use. As a result of those efforts, the developer filed this application to rezone the property to allow for residential development and to map MIH on the entire rezoning area. Under the proposed rezoning, MIH will apply to both the new development proposed by the applicant and also to any future development on the sites of the uh, nearby three owner occupied residences. Unfortunately, develop the developer has recently determined the need uh, for the workforce option in order to proceed with construction. Uh, in fact, they have informed me that if they do not, if we do not include the workforce modification, they will withdraw the application and build the hotel, which is legal under existing zoning in which the community has been working so hard to stop for the past two plus years. Consequently, I'm asking, not asking you to choose between MIH income vans. I'm asking you to choose between a new residential development that we desperately need with MIH over an as of right development of a hotel. Uh, lastly, significantly, this will be the first ever MIH mapping in this community district. Uh, just last week, uh, DCP published uh, analysis confirming what we already see on the ground. Some neighborhoods have borne a disproportionate burden of increased development and some neighborhoods have not. Uh, this is not a, pro a perfect project. I understand that the workforce MIH option is not ideal, but the project has wide community support and will provide new residential units and neighborhood serving retail on the ground floor, which will much far, far better meet the needs uh, in this area rather than a hotel. Community worked very hard to bring this project and this developer to a place of compromise for the public benefit and Bay Ridge deserves this chance to build more affordable housing. And that's why I urge the members of the subcommittee uh, to listen to the community and support this project today. Thank you, Chair Moya. Thank you. Uh, is Council Member Yeager going to speak as well? Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I had the same unmuting problem with Justin. It's a Brooklyn thing. You guys don't want us to speak. Um, Chair, at first, I, I just want to express my gratitude to the Chair for uh, uh, really uh, delving deeply into this project from the very beginning and uh, learning about it, understanding it. He knows our neighborhoods, and I'm, I'm grateful uh, to the to the way he's taken the time to learn Borough Park and understand it. Um, uh, this project, I wish I had the success that uh, Councilman Brandon did uh, in in shepherding it through. Um, we we could not get to that conclusion, and uh, this not not only had a, a hearing at the community board uh, where the community board rejected it, but something that 
um, uh, is really unheard of in these matters, we convinced the community board to hear it again, to give it a second bite at the apple, uh, to give the applicant the chance to come back to the community and make the kind of revisions that would have been uh, that would have been amenable uh, to the neighborhood. As the chair stated, this is primarily a residential area. Um, uh, it is a primarily a low rise area. It is also uh, the, the rezoning would encompass a police precinct, which is right next door to the, to the proposed development area. It is an incredibly busy block. Um, one of the concerns of the community, in addition to the commercial uh, aspect of the proposal, was, uh, was rezoning the police precinct um, and what that could possibly entail. Uh, first of all, the parking on that block, as we know, uh, Police precincts are quite busy, and and uh, parking in front of police precincts and on those blocks is simply non-existent. And simply moving from uh, along those blocks is is very difficult. This is one block uh, um, north of 60th Street, which means that any backup on this block is really going to uh, cause a, a reverberating effect on 60th Street itself. And uh, the the confluence of events just simply made this unamenable. Um, we've done everything we can to try to get this project to be something that the community could could accept into it, but it simply cannot. Um, but what I mostly want to state on the record is uh, on Friday, uh, it was represented to this council by the applicant that they would be withdrawing, uh, going back to the drawing board and coming up with something new. And for whatever reason, that uh, opinion of theirs changed yesterday when the council was informed that uh, they would not be withdrawing. So. Uh, with that, uh, the, this committee, of which I am not a member, uh, was forced to do something which it doesn't like to do, and, and that's disapprove an application, because we like to grow this city. And unfortunately, at this place and this time, we're not able to do that, and I'm grateful to the subcommittee for hearing this matter and for the conclusion that it reached. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Council Member. Uh, we are also, I believe, joined by uh, Council Member Menchaca. Uh, I now call for a vote to approve LU-729 to approve with modifications I have described, uh, LUs 714, 715, 727, and 728, and to disapprove LUs 722 and 723. Uh, Council, please call the roll. Chair Moya. Aburai. Council Member Reynoso. Um, I'm going to pass. Go. Give me. I'm going to pass. Give me a second. Council Member Gordenchik. Aye. Council Member Ayala. Aye. Uh, I'm sorry. Councilman Mariala, I'm sorry. Was that, what was, did you vote? You said aye. I did, I said aye. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Council Member Rivera. Aye. Council Member Borelli. I vote aye, thank you. Council Member Levin. Aye. I vote aye on all. Council Member Reynoso. I'm going to vote um, aye on all and explain my vote at a further hearing. Thank you. A vote of seven in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. The items are approved and recommended to the full land use committee. Uh, 
Thank you, Arthur. Uh, we now uh, turn to our hearings, uh, but before we begin, uh, I want to recognize uh, the subcommittee council to review the remote meeting procedures. Thank you, Chair Moya. I am Arthur Ha, counsel to this subcommittee. Members of the public wishing to testify were asked to register for today's hearings. If you wish to testify and have not already registered, we ask that you please do so now by visiting the New York City Council website at www council.nyc.gov to sign up. Members of the public may also view a live stream broadcast of this meeting at the council's website. As a technical note, for the benefit of the viewing public, if you need an accessible version of this presentation, uh, of any presentation shown in this meeting, please send an email request to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. When called to testify, individuals appearing before the subcommittee will remain muted until recognized by the chair to speak. Applicant teams will be recognized as a group and called first. Members of the public will be called and recognized as panels in groups of up to four names at a time. When the chair recognizes you, your microphone will be unmuted. Please take a moment to check your device and confirm that it is uh, that your microphone is on before you begin speaking. There is a slight delay in the process of unmuting. Public testimony will be limited to two minutes per witness. If you have additional testimony you would like the subcommittee to consider, or if you have written testimony you would like to submit instead of appearing before the subcommittee, you may email it to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the LU number and or project name in the subject line of your email. During the hearing, council members with questions should use the Zoom raise hand function. The raise hand button should appear at the bottom of your participant panel. Council, uh, council members with questions will be announced in the order of raised hands and the chair will recognize members to speak. Witnesses are requested to remain in the meeting until excused by the chair as members may have questions. Finally, there will be pauses over the course of this meeting due to various technical reasons, and we ask that you please be patient as we work through any issues. Chair Moya will now continue with today's agenda items. Uh, thank you, Arthur. Uh, I now open the public hearing on the pre-considered LU item for the 245-01 Jamaica Avenue rezoning proposal under ULIP number uh, C200252 ZMQ relating to property in council member Gredentic's district in Queens. The proposal seeks a zoning map amendment to change an R4C13 district to an R4C23 district. If approved, this application would enable uh, the applicant to file a special permit application to the Board of Standards and Appeals to legalize a physical uh, culture establishment within the existing commercial building at the site. Um, but before uh, we, we move uh, forward, I just wanted to check to see if uh, Council Member Grudencic uh, wanted to make any remarks on this project. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, we have worked very closely with the applicant here, with the community, uh, with local civic organizations. Um, it, it's a small rezoning, but it hasn't been easy um, because of concerns that um, a hotel could be built on the site. It is right on top of the Cross Island Parkway uh, at Jamaica slash Jericho Turnpike. So uh, we did have those concerns. You're going to hear from the applicant now. Uh, about what they are doing to ameliorate those concerns. And this has uh, now has the strong support of the local community and community board 13. So let's uh, proceed with the hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, um, council member. Uh, council, please call the first panel uh, for this item. The applicant panel includes Richard Lobel and Fayon Baton, land use council appearing on behalf of the applicant. Also available for questions and answers will be Antonio Marino and Giuseppe Marino. Panelists, if you have not already done so, please accept the unmute request in order to begin speaking. Council, can you please uh, administer uh, the affirmation? Panelists, please raise your right hands. You affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions. I do. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, but before we begin, I just want to remind everyone we're in receipt of your uh, slideshow presentation for this proposal. Uh, when you're ready to present the slideshow, please uh, say so, and it will be displayed on the screen by our staff. Slides will be advanced when you say next. Please note that there may be a slight delay in both the initial loading and the advancing of slides. 
Uh, for members of the viewing public uh, who require an accessible version of this presentation, uh, please send an email request to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. And now if the panelists would please uh, restate uh, your names and affirmation for the record, you may begin. Thank you, Chair Moya. Council members Richard Lobel of Sheldon Lobel PC for the applicant. Pam Baton from Sheldon Lobel PC from the applicant. Thank you, you may begin. Thank you, Chair Moya. Council members, good morning. Uh, we're here to review the 24501 Jamaica Avenue rezoning. If you can load the presentation, please. I can scroll through quickly. So the property you see before you, 24501 to 24525 Jamaica Avenue is a one-story commercial building. Um, uh, next slide, please. This property is currently located within an R4 C13 commercial district. The rezoning, uh, as stated by Chair Moya, simply seeks to rezone this to a C23. You'll note from the zoning map uh, of the area that the surrounding blocks along Jamaica Avenue to the east are zoned C13. So this is a, an active commercial thoroughfare, as well as along Braddock Avenue to the uh, west and northwest of the site. Next slide. You can see the property located within the uh, dotted area as well as the red highlighted area. This is an 80 foot deep property running roughly 200 feet along Jamaica Avenue. Across the street is Nassau County. Um, the existing shopping center has been located at this site since uh, the building was constructed sometime in the 1930s uh, and has been operating with regards to commercial uses uh, consistent during that time. Uh, however, the Property was formerly zoned C2, and the zoning changed to C1 in 2013 in the Belrose uh, Floral Park Glen Oaks rezoning. So there was a special permit from BSA granted in 1994 to allow for a PCE or gym use at the site, which later became non-conforming when the site was rezoned to C1. Subsequently, the applicant went to BSA in 2016 to legalize that PCE by way of variance. But there's other PCEs at the spice site, specifically a, uh, a karate studio, which is um, loved by the local community and heavily utilized, which cannot be legalized under the existing C1 so zoning, thus the need for the C2 rezoning. Next slide. As was stated, you can see the land use in the area from the colored map. You have the area highlighted in red, uh, an existing ground floor commercial. There's commercial to the west along Braddock Avenue. Uh, and you can see the two-story uh, commercial residential buildings located along Jamaica Avenue. This is undoubtedly a commercial thoroughfare in the surrounding area. Next slide. This is merely a depiction of what the zoning map would be after the rezoning. Um, we're merely changing from a C13 to a C23. Uh, after conversion to a C23, the applicant would then be able to go through a special permit process at BSA to allow for a PCE use. I'm sure the council members have heard this before, or most of them have. Uh, we've brought rezonings before to the council, which are similar uh, in allowing for a C1 commercial overlay to be rezoned to a C2. Uh, in addition to some slightly expanded uses available in the C2, home improvement stores, plumbing supply and such, most importantly, the PCE use or physical culture establishment is permitted by application in a C2 and not within a C1. So we end up in this position where applicants who want to use properties for PCE uses are uh, oftentimes forced to bring this rezoning prior to even applying at BSA. Next slide. So I don't wish to belabor this. Uh, if you can please page through the several pages of photos, you can see pictures of the existing ground floor commercial uses as uh, at the site, as well as the adjacent commercial uses on the block to the right and the lower left. Uh, and so um, the plans in this, in this uh, rezoning depict uh, exactly what exists at the site, which is the existing ground floor commercial uses, which would now uh, be able to legalize the PCEs uh, subject to the available rezoning. Um, and as you page through the last few slides, which are plans of the application, I would just point to what Council Member Gradenchik mentioned, which is that the applicants worked hard with the community in order to uh, develop a, a, a method going forward where the C2 would not cause for hotels in the area. So C2 districts uh, within a certain square foot footage of or linear feet from a 
a, uh, a highway expressway um, are able to apply for uh, a, um, a hotel use at DOB. This was seen as something which was not desired by the community board nor by the applicant. So the applicant successfully, uh, after many discussions with CB13, uh, consented to the recordation of a restrictive declaration, which has, I understand, been sent for recordation, uh, which would prevent the property from being used as a hotel or as a homeless shelter. Uh, and this was something which was, uh, there was a unity and interest on behalf of the applicant. The applicant just wishes to be able to have a productive commercial development going forward, as does the community. And so we were happy to come to this agreement and we're happy to answer any questions from the committee. Thank you. Um, just quickly before I turn it over to Council Member Gudenchek, I just have a couple of questions. Um, so what is the current occupancy within the uh, project area? And do you have any future tenants in mind for the space today? Well, so um, sadly, largely on, a, on, a, on account of COVID, the, um, the, applicant, uh, the applicant's tenant in Body by Fitness, which is the largest uh, tenant in the site, has left the property. So there's that 5,800 square foot, roughly 5,800 square feet of gym use, which is legal pursuant to BSA variance and could become again legalized through the special permit process, which is now vacant. Um, the applicant has talked to various food stores, uh, one of which fell through. So, um, you know, the C2 use here and the C2 overlay really helps the applicant in, in broadening the range of commercial uses that can occupy the property. It's um, nobody really wants to see the site go dark. And so, um, you know, the best thing to say is that we have been in touch with certain tenants. Uh, we're hopeful that we can get a gym back in the space. Importantly, the karate studio is still operational. It's roughly 2,600 square feet uh, and would be able to be legalized pursuant to the PCE special permit. The remainder of the site is located by, is located, um, operated with uh, general use group six commercial uses, uh, such as food stores, there's a Dunkin' Donuts and such. Thank you. And um, how do you plan to address the concerns raised by uh, the uh, community board that a hotel should not be built on this site? So um, the, thank you for the question. The, uh, the applicant has negotiated a restrictive declaration which has been submitted for recordation with the county clerk. Uh, and the restrictive declaration is very straightforward. Um, the, primary, um, the primary goal of the restrictive declaration being to limit um, transient hotels or homeless shelters. Uh, so the first paragraph of the restrictive declaration so restricts the premises stating that it should not be used or occupied by a use group five transient hotel or homeless shelter. Um, there's also a provision which uh, was suggested by the applicant at 500 linear feet was requested by the community board to be expanded to 1,000 feet, which grants property owners within 1,000 linear feet of the site with standing to enforce the restrictive declaration. Uh, the applicant here is, has operated in good faith through the entirety of the application, has been in before the community board for literally for years um, it, with applications regarding the PCE. So um, we're happy to enter into this restrictive declaration. We're happy to grant the local community the ability to enforce the declaration. Frankly, we feel that uh, this is one of those documents which is going to be put in a drawer and not used because the applicant here uh, intends to honor this declaration and to uh, so, so limit the site. And uh, how do you respond to the borough president's recommendation that prevailing wages, uh, union labor, uh, and or MWBE uh, businesses be used for construction uh, of this project? Yeah, Chair, you know, this is a, a something which um, frequently arises uh, with regards to the Queensborough President as well as the Council. Um, here, frankly, the application is, a, is, I think, what you'd refer to as a no-work application. Um, any work to be done at the site would be internal, maybe demolition of partitions and stuff. So there's really no construction intended. In fact, the rezoning only permits a bulk of one FAR for commercial use, and the existing building is at a 0.97. So there can be no material enlargement of the site. Uh, and so um, there's really no construction jobs to speak of here. Um, to the extent that there was any uh, change and the applicant was going to go in for any construction, we would consult with the Queensborough President's Office. But at this time, it's, it's not only unlikely, it's, it's, um, you know, it's, it, it lacks any type of substance to submit an application to DOB. We just don't have any additional score feet. Great, thank you. Um, that's it for me. Um, I wanna turn it over to Council Member Grudenchek for a few questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think you pretty much have covered it for me. Um, 
I want to thank the applicant and the owner of the property for uh, their willingness to work with the community. Um, the hotel thing was, uh, you know, a bit sticky for us, Mr. Chairman. Um, but uh, we, we thought that the restrictive declaration uh, was the best thing that we could get. Um, and I didn't want to, I was really concerned about uh, putting yet another business out of business, um, a physical cultural establishment um, that, are, that still exists there. And like much of the city, um, this community has been hammered by COVID and uh, we continue to see empty storefronts popping up without being, um, without being filled. So I think that this is uh, a reasonable accommodation on all parts and I do support it. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Gudenchik. Um, thank you again for your testimony. Uh, Council, do we have any council members that have questions uh, for this panel? No, oh, Chair, I see no members with questions for the panel. Okay. Um, if there are any members of the public who wish to testify on 245-01 uh, Jamaica Avenue rezoning proposal, uh, please, please uh, press the raise hand button now and the meeting will stand at ease while we check for members of the public. Chair Moya, I see no members of the public who wish to testify on this item. There being no members of the public who wish to testify on the 45-01 Jamaica Avenue rezoning proposal on the ULIP number uh, C200252 uh, ZMQ, the public hearing is now closed and this item is laid over. Uh, thank you very much again for your testimony. Uh, I now want to open uh, the public hearing on the pre-considered LU items for the 91-3263 uh, drive rezoning proposal on the ULIPS number C200178 ZMQ and N0 uh, and N200179 ZRQ relating to property in council member uh, Koslowitz's district in Queens. The proposal seeks a zoning map amendment to change an existing R4C22 district to an R7A-C23 district and a related zoning text amendment to establishing mandatory inclusionary housing area utilizing options one and two. The proposed action would facilitate the development of a new nine-story mixed-use building with approximately 74 uh, dwelling units, up to 24 of which would be affordable, uh, as well as ground floor commercial use and an attended parking garage with 17 spaces uh, with 17 spaces accessory to the residential use and 29 spaces uh, accessory to the commercial use. Um, I'm not sure if we have um, Council Member Koslowitz. No? Chair, yeah, I do not see Council Member Koslowitz. Okay. Um, and with that, uh, Council, can you please call uh, the first panel for this item? The applicant panel includes Frank St. Jacques, Land Use Counsel for the applicant. Also on hand for additional question and answer support are Lauren George and Warren Saberman. Panelists, if you have not already done so, please accept the unmute request in order to begin speaking. Council, can you please administer the affirmation? Panelists, please raise your right hands. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? I do. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Um, when you're ready, uh, please, uh, when you're ready to display your slideshow presentation, uh, please say so, and it will be shown on screen by our staff. Slides will be advanced when you say next. Please note that there may be a slight delay in both the initial loading and the advancing of slides. Once again, for the benefit of the viewing public, if you need an accessible version of this presentation, uh, please send an email request to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. And now if the panelists would please uh, restate your names and affirmation for the record, you may begin. Thank you, Chair Moya. Uh, good morning. Um, my name is Frank St. Jacques with Ackerman LLP for the applicant. Um, and you can uh, please go ahead and, and uh, display the slideshow. Thank you. Um, uh, next slide, please. 
the proposed uh, area to be rezoned uh, was zoned in 1961 with an R4 zoning district and a C22 commercial overlay that has remained in place over the last 60 years. That's uh, shown here on this uh, zoning map in detail. The adjacent zoning district to the east is a mid-density R71 non-contextual zoning district. Next slide, please. As you can see in this aerial view, the surrounding area is characterized primarily by multifamily residential use with commercial uses along 63rd Drive and then along Queens Boulevard, which is to the north of the site. The area has access to several bus lines and the MR 63rd Drive Regal Park subway station is four blocks to the north at Queens Boulevard. You can also see the Long Island Railroad uh, directly south of the site. Next slide, please. Other details to note on this land use map are that 63rd Drive is a wide street. And as we saw in the last slide, the elevated tracks to the Long Island Railroad uh, main line are located directly south of the site, which create open space. Next slide, please. The site is shown here on this zoning map uh, outlined in red, uh, as well as the rezoning area. The site uh, is about 13,731 square feet and it has 140 feet of frontage on 63rd Drive and 100 feet of frontage on Austin Street. Next slide, please. And then in these images, you can see some of the multifamily residential context surrounding the development site and the development site itself uh, surrounded by the green construction fencing, which is unimproved and vacant. Next slide, please. The proposed R7A C23 district uh, shown here on the zoning change map on the right hand side of the screen uh, would promote the production of new housing in community district six, which has a low vacancy rate and the majority of housing stock was built before 1970. The proposed rezoning would facilitate new residential development with the provision of permanently and income restricted housing on underutilized land on a wide street near mass transit. The proposed R7A allows comparable bulk to the adjacent R71 zoning district, but with the predictability of the contextual envelope. Next slide, please. Uh, project details are shown here. Uh, this is a nine-story mixed-use building. Um, since the, the project was filed, uh, there's been a reduction in the residential floor area and the number of dwelling units uh, down to 70 units and about 63,000 square feet. Um, the project was initially filed with the intention to provide uh, affordable independent residences for seniors uh, as part of the, the project using HPD's privately funded affordable residences for seniors term sheet, but we understand that it's now being rescinded, uh, so we've reduced the project, um, the, the project is recording uh, reduction in uh, residential floor area arriving at the 70 units. Uh, 21 of the uh, Units will be permanently income restricted under MIH uh, option two, that's 30% uh, at a weighted average of 80% of the area median income. And the applicant has committed to providing two of the three MIH in income bands at 60% AMI. Uh, the applicant's goal with uh, MIH option two and, and this further commitment uh, to providing two income bands at 60% AMI was to maximize the amount of permanently income restricted housing. Uh, next and last slide, please. And finally, here are some renderings showing uh, the, the proposed development as well as a site plan. Uh, the ground floor would contain commercial space uh, that would be divided for local retail and service type uses to serve the surrounding residential neighborhood. And the intent is to find tenants that are consistent with the uses found along 63rd Drive. Uh, which are more locally oriented uh, than those found along the nearby Queens Boulevard. So these would include eating and drinking, uh, pharmacy salons, retail shops, cleaners, coffee shops, things like that. Um, that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, I just have uh, two questions. Uh, one, uh, can you uh, commit to the uh, two thirds of the MIH units to be reserved for households earning up to uh, 60% AMI? Uh, yes, we, we've um, uh, provided a, a letter to uh, Community Board 6, uh, and we are happy to, to um, you know, provide a, a similar letter to the council. Great. Uh, and then how do you respond to the borough president's uh, conditional approval that there should be a goal of 30% uh, for local hiring and the use of MWBE businesses in uh, the construction and development of this project um, with 
quarterly reportings? Right, so th this applicant um, currently regularly works uh, with local and MWV labor and anticipates doing so for this development as well. Great, uh, thank you very much. Um, I now wanna invite uh, my colleagues to ask any questions uh, for the applicant panel. Um, council, do we have any uh, council members that have any questions? Chair, Council Member Ayala has a question. Do we know what the average annual income is in that community? Yes, Frank, are you able to unmute? Are we gotta unmute uh, Frank if we can, yeah. Hold on. So there are two I, figures. I, I apologize. I, I muted myself and was unable to unmute. Um, so according to the, the Furman Center, Center data, um, the uh, median household income in 2018 was uh, $82,820. So um, we believe that uh, the, the proposed affordability levels are, are in line with that um, you know, higher median uh, income for the area. That was my only question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilman Briala. Um, council, do we have any other council members with questions? No, Chair. I see no other members with questions for the panel. Okay. Um, there being no further questions, uh, the applicant panel uh, is excused. Thank you again um, for your testimony today. Uh, Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on the 91-32 uh, 63rd Drive uh, rezoning application? Yes, Chair, we have one public witness who has signed up to speak and is present. Uh, for members of the public here to testify, please note again uh, that witnesses will be called in panels. Once all panelists in your group have completed their testimony, you'll be removed from the meeting. Uh, and you may continue to view the live stream broadcast of this hearing at the council website. And we will now hear from the first panel, which will include Michelle Gomez. Michelle Gomez will be the first speaker. Okay. Um, uh, good afternoon. My question was- One second, was Michelle, before you start, I'm sorry. Uh, just one second. I just wanna remind uh, members of the public that you'll be given uh, two minutes to speak. Um, please do not begin until the Sergeant at Arms uh, has started the clock. So Michelle, whenever you're ready. Uh, yes, my question was answered. It was uh, in regards to the income of the area and uh, the affordable housing offering. So he answered it to one of the council members. Thank you very much. Okay, Michelle, thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Chair, that is the uh, sole speaker for this panel. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, if there's any other members of the public who wish to testify uh, on the 91-3263 uh, drive rezoning proposal, uh, please press the raise hand button now. Uh, the meeting will now stand at ease while we check for members of the public. Chair, I see no other members of the public who wish to testify on this item. Thank you. Uh, there being no uh, members of the public who wish to testify on the 91-3263rd Drive rezoning proposal under the ULERP numbers C200178, ZMQ, and N200179, ZRQ, the public hearing is now closed and the item is laid over. Uh, I now open the public hearing on the pre-considered LU items for the uh, Arvern East proposal submitted by HBD under ULERP uh, numbers C210070, ZMQ, N210071, ZRQ, and N210069, HNQ, relating to property. 
relating to property in the uh, Arbor neighborhood of uh, in Council District 31 in Queens. The proposal seeks to set uh, of related land use actions, including a zoning map amendment to rezone a portion of the uh, Arvern Urban Renewal Area from a C44 district to the special uh, MX21 uh, mixed use district as an M14R6 district, uh, a zoning text amendment to create the new MX21 district and the designation of an urban development action area and approval of an urban development action project. Uh, the proposed actions would facilitate the development of a mixed use development with approximately 1,650 dwelling units, including an 80-20 mix of 1,320 affordable and 330 market rate units, uh, 252,000 square feet of commercial space, 22 square feet of commercial facility space, 10,000 square feet of manufacturing space, and 3.3 acres of privately owned recreational and open space, 15 acres of open space, and approximately 1,765 parking spaces. Uh, Council, can you please call the first panel uh, for this item? The lead applicant panel for this item includes Kevin Paris and Elizabeth Rolfing appearing on behalf of the New York City Housing uh, Department of Housing Preservation and Development, and Sarah Levinson appearing on behalf of the project sponsor, LM Development Partners uh, Inc. Also appearing and available for support on questions and answers uh, are Paris Strotter and Matthew Giuliana uh, of New York City HPD. Eric Peterson, Mitchell Loring, Nick Molinari of New York City Parks, Douglas Adams, City Hall, and Ira Lichtiger, Eric Bluestone, Lester Petraca, Thomas Freeland, Spencer Orcus, Jerome Dunbar, Yasmin Cornelius, Josh Reinsmith, David Udelson, David Court, Allison Ruddock, and Walter Meyer, all representing various uh, development partners and consultants uh, on the project. Panelists, if you have not already done so, please accept the unmute request in order to begin speaking. Okay, um, council, if you can uh, please uh, administer the affirmation. Panelists, please raise your right hands. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? I do. I do. I do. I do. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Uh, thank you. Uh, we are in uh, receipt of your uh, slideshow presentation for this proposal. Uh, when you're ready uh, for it to be presented, please say so, and it will be displayed on screen by our staff. Slides will be uh, advanced when you say next. Please note that there may be a slight delay in both the initial loading and the advancing of slides. Once again, anyone requiring a, an accessible version of this presentation may send an email request to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. And now if the panelists would uh, please restate your names uh, and affirmation for the record, uh, you may begin. Good morning. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Rolfing. I'm the Chief of Staff for um, the Department of Housing Preservation and Development. Um, I'm going to uh, briefly testify and then turn things over um, to the development team for the presentation. Um, this land use item pertains to an urban development action area designation, urban development action area project approval of city owned lots and a zoning map and text amendment for a certain area within the project to allow for microbrewery use, all located in Queens Council District 31 and known as Arvern East. Arvern East is a master planned 81 acre mixed use mixed income development with 1,650 residential units, including 1,320 affordable units and approximately 35 acre nature preserve and public park a new dune system for coastal protection, and new streets and infrastructure on a 116-acre vacant oceanfront site in Edgemere, Queens. The project received its development approvals as part of the Second Amendment to the Arvern Urban Renewal Plan in 2003, which included an EIS that mandated construction of a 35-acre nature preserve as an obligation for development of the Arvern East area. 
HBD set this area out for RFP following this approval and selected a developer in 2006. The project was unable to proceed due to the housing market crash in 2008 and again after Hurricane Sandy in 2013. To fa facilitate development of this project, HPD proposed an infusion of city capital to offset developer obligations associated with the creation of the nature preserve and infrastructure. The actions cited above will establish a single UDAP area across the Arvern East Development Site and Nature Preserve and will allow for the creation of the preserve. Today, HPD is before the zoning subcommittee seeking approval of the Arvern East project. Um, if, if we could have the presentation loaded, I will turn things over to Sarah Levinson from the development team. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, Kevin, are you starting us off or do you want me yeah. to? Okay, no problem, Sarah. I'll, I'll kick us off. Um, good morning and thank you, um, City Council members. Um, as stated earlier, my name is Kevin Paris. I am the director for HPD's Queens planning team. And today we will be discussing our plans for the Arvanese project. Um, as stated by my colleague, um, Arvanese is a master plan project that will transform an approximate 116 acre vacant oceanfront site into a multifaceted resilient development one that will bring the Auburn and Edgemere communities new mixed income residential opportunities, um, diverse neighborhood retail, parking, infrastructure improvements, vast open space and other community amenities. Next slide, please. Um, just briefly restating some of the background, um, just so we can set some of the context for what folks will be hearing um, from, the, from, the re from the rest of the development team this morning. Um, the the Arvanese project is a continuation of the city's investment into the Rockaways. This project was part of a set of actions approved in 2003 to facilitate development across what you see on the screen, the western, central, and um, eastern portions of the Auburn urban renewal area. Uh, these actions that were approved um, helped to facilitate the development of the western portion of the URA, um, which today is known as Auburn by the Sea. Um, as well as setting the stage to build out the central and eastern portions. Um, again, as was previously mentioned, um, a couple of significant um, situations happened that hampered our ability to advance um, the development of the rest of the project, um, namely the market crash um, and Superstorm Sandy, which had a severe impact on this community. Next slide, please. The Arvanese project represented today will continue the goals envisioned for the Eastern Rockaways as an innovative, resilient community, as well as a regional destination. In order to further these goals, HPD will need to seek approval for a set of actions, which include the designation of an urban development action area and UDAP approval for the development site and the nature preserve, um, as well as seeking a zoning map and text amendment to establish a mixed use district over a portion of the development site for a proposed microbrewery use. Um, as mentioned again, I'm joined here with our development partners um, and I will now turn it over to them to discuss the further vision for the Arvin East um, and how these actions will help facilitate that project. Um, next slide, please. Thank you, Kevin. Good morning, Chair Moya and council members. I'm Sarah Levinson, a senior director at l &M Development Partners and the development team lead for the Arvin East project. The development team comprises l and Development Partners, the Bluestone Organization, and Triangle Equities, three full-service real estate firms that have been working together for over 15 years and have been investing in the Rockaway Peninsula for about a decade, providing high-quality, sustainable, and resilient affordable housing. Next slide, please. I'm going to start this morning on, on the Nature Preserve, which is located on the western portion of the site between Beach 44th Street and Beach 56th Place. It's approximately 35 acres. We've been working closely with the Parks Department over the past several years to create a design that is intended to restore and promote native ecology. In addition, we're really focused on creating a community asset here and making sure that access is provided throughout the preserve from a network of pathways that go from east to west and north to south, really ensuring that neighborhood residents are able to access the preserve in various locations, but also those that are traveling to the site uh, via train could access the preserve and the boardwalk as well. In addition, we're working with the Parks Department on strategies to leverage the preserve to support additional community programming and engagement. Uh, we're hoping to start restoration uh, later this year. Next slide, please. The vision for the development site is guided by four principles, health and wellness, community and cultural integration, economic diversity and development, and climate resiliency and energy efficiency. Next slide, please. 
Starting with the residential component of the development site, the project will include 1,650 units of housing comprising a mix of typologies at varying density. 80% will be affordable to a wide range of incomes from low, moderate, and middle income households. There will be home ownership opportunities provided. The balance of the site or 20% will be a for sale market rate product. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. You can advance, thank you so much. Up to 500,000 square feet of commercial space is permitted and approximately 280 to 300,000 square feet is currently anticipated, comprising retail, manufacturing, community facility uses, inclusive of a community center, a programming of which will be guided by future community engagement. The project not only strives to address local retail needs, but leverage project opportunities to support existing and new local businesses. In addition, the development will provide job training support in the program in areas of green infrastructure, agricultural, building maintenance, and culinary industries. The project will include a variety of retail typologies, including mid-box retail at the entry of the retail corridor, ground floor neighborhood retail opportunities and services to support existing and future residents, and approximately 150 key boutique hotels that would provide year-round programming and jobs, catering and event services, meeting rooms, and a great alternative to JFK accommodations. Seasonal concessions, which are smaller spaces that engage with the beach plaza and the boardwalk that are bike friendly, accessible to all, coupled with free outdoor programming. And the Rockaway Brewing Company Brewery and Tap House, which will draw patrons and visitors year round to the project's retail promenade. They are a well-established local craft brewery founded in Rockaway. With the brewers our anchor tenant, the team can further secure financing and attract local and seasonal retail tenants, bringing new opportunities for long-term and sustained economic development. Next slide, please. In addition to the nature preserve, there are ample opportunities for a variety of open and recreation spaces, including an approximately two acre not-for-profit run urban farm and an additional 10 and a half acres of outdoor destination recreation space. We'll be engaging the community in a series of meetings to better identify uh, desired uses here. Next slide, please. This is a conceptual rendering looking north up the retail corridor. It represents how the retail and the open, open space strategies really come together and that the residential is pulled north but steps down in density as you approach the boardwalk. Next slide, please. Resiliency is an important component of the project design and we're really attacking this on three levels from a site design standpoint, from a topographic standpoint and all the way down to the individual building level. Starting with site design, um, as I mentioned, the development is pulled back from the coast with the densest development concentrated along Edgemere Avenue. Uh, rainwater harvesting will be used for irrigation, all stormwater will be managed on site, and we'll be specifying permeable materials on all paved surfaces where possible. And most importantly, there will be a system of rain gardens and bioswales that will be planted with indigenous and native plantings that will really work to enhance retention and infiltration throughout the site. Next slide, please. Moving to topography, the development site, depending on location, will be raised between three and eight feet, depending on the area. Just for to give some context, the concern, uh, the current design flood elevation here is at plus twelve. The sandy storm inundation was at plus fourteen, and our proposed pro project elevation is up to plus sixteen. So that means that all ground floor non-residential spaces, apartments, main lobbies, mechanical equipment are all safely um, above this plus sixteen level. Next slide, please. The resilient and energy efficient strategies that we're employing really work together to create a self-sustaining community. Um, looking at some of the energy efficient strategies uh, we're looking to employ are buildings that are constructed with passive house uh, design strategies, geothermal methodologies for heating, cooling, and domestic hot water, extensive PV arrays on all building typologies and over surface parking lots. These methodologies really contribute to reduced energy consumption and contribute to the overall goal of the project um, being fossil fuel free. Next slide, please. In conclusion, the actions before the council today will enable community development that provides high quality and rental home ownership opportunities for all, retail and community facility space that's driven by local needs and supporting local jobs and businesses, local job creation, over 60 acres of outdoor recreation space, a community that showcases resilient and sustainable design features, and a development that is defined and driven by continued community engagement. Next slide, please. Thank you for your time this morning. I'm joined by members of the development team, Land Use and Environmental Council, 
BHP, the environmental consultant and civil engineer, and local office landscape, the project landscape designer. In addition to our colleagues from NYC Parks and HPD, we're happy to answer any questions from the committee at this time. Thank you. Thank you. A um, couple of questions here. Uh, so we know with the COVID-19, it has exposed uh, some significant gaps in uh, quality uh, health care um, based on income uh, and racial demographics. Uh, can the administration commit uh, to um, sitting a H&H &H facility uh, on the Rockaway Peninsula? Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, I will attempt to field that question. Um, um, so what I can speak to is that the city is currently looking at ways in which we can address um, those severe needs um, in the peninsula, um, not just with, with this project, but all projects that's coming online in the area. Um, so that is a continuing conversation um, that, uh, that, that, that's currently happening um, to see how we can address that. I, I can't speak to any commitments right now um, as part of this meeting. Okay. Uh, and what will uh, HPD require in terms of MWBE uh, contracting uh, and local hiring through their uh, financing of this project? So currently, um, as with all um, HPD projects, there, there, there's a commitment that um, I believe the bar said at, at a minimum of 20% of, of um, the development, of, well, not necessarily the development team, but part of the overall development of the site um, will be contracted out to MWBE um, contractors. I um, mean, we're working with the development team on understanding and tracking um, how that how that how that um, benchmark is going to be met. Okay, so walk walk us through who is responsible um, for uh, each phase of the widening of Edgemere Avenue. Thank you. Um, so I can speak to the first um, phase. So this project, um, as part of all of the extensive actions that you've heard about today, part of the infrastructure work that's going to be taking place is the widening of Edgemere Avenue from Beach 32nd Street to Beach 38th Street. Um, the development team has been working in lockstep with DOT um, on that reconstruction plan. Um, and as part of our continued um, deliberation and, and conversations with the community, um, there's also been an additional commitment made that the development team um, will be doing the design work for the um, widening of Edgemere Avenue, continuing west from Beach 38th Street to Beach on um, 62nd Street. Right, but, but, but the question is who's responsible for each phase? So the development team will be responsible for the widening of the, of, of the street and I can turn it over to my development partners. I can talk through those conversations that they've been working with um, further. And can we have Sarah unmuted please? Yeah. I'm sorry. Sarah, yep. Sorry about that, thank you. Um, so as it relates to um, the existing widening between, widening between 32nd and 38th Street, the development team has been taking the lead on the design and coordination um, with DOT and HPD to um, have plans reviewed and approved. Uh, we will, uh, actually we just submitted our 100% set to DOT and DEP uh, last week. So once we have that approval, the development team will be um, constructing that section of uh, Edgemere Avenue under, um, in, I guess, in connection with DOT as it relates to the widening further west of 38th Street. Um, we have secured a proposal for the design um, for that widening and we'll commence that, um, we'll commence that process, I think later this year. So just so I'm clear, uh, HPD is responsible or DOT is responsible for the widening of so I think it's um, I think so it's a combination of all. Specifically, who's responsible for each phase of the widening? Sure. So we are responsible for uh, the design and construction of the widening between 32nd and 38th Street, um, obviously under uh, review and approval with uh, DOT and DEP. HPD is pro providing um, some of the financing for that. As it relates to the widening from uh, 38th to 62nd Street. 
the, the development team is responsible for taking the lead on the design. Uh, as it relates to construction, I don't believe it's been um, determined who will be constructing that portion of the road. That's correct. Okay. But we are prepared to start design. Okay. Uh, can you also walk me through who's responsible for the private street network construction and the maintenance of it? Sure. Uh, the development team is responsible for the design and construction of the private street network. We will be working um, again closely with our DOT colleagues to ensure that the, the roads are built to DOT spec. That said, the Borough Commissioner's Office had made the request that cosmetic changes be made, whether it's different street signage and things of that nature for the private streets. Uh, so that will be what I think is the, the, different, uh, the main difference between a city street versus these private streets, um, something very cosmetic. And uh, while they are considered private streets, they will be maintained by a project-wide uh, homeowners association. Okay. Um, and the previous, uh, iterations of this project included the construction of a new school. Uh, is there still space uh, allocated for a new school within the project area? And does uh, SCA uh, have any other real estate under its control to build a new school offsite? Um, and how many students could be accommodated there? So when you when we discuss the project area, I believe the project area that that this school is going to be so it's not part of the project area for this development, the Arvin East development. It is part of the project area associated with the Arvin Urban Renewal, the uh, the Second Amendment that happened in two thousand and three, and there's still space um, that's um, that's that's within um, SCA DOE DOE um, jurisdiction for the development of a school um, at such time that one is um, identified to, to to be needed. Okay, um, and who manages the current uh, beach concession contracts uh, for this area? I believe that's under the jurisdiction of the Parks Department. Eric, do you wanna to speak to that? We'll need Eric um, Peterson unmuted. Thank you. Yes, uh, the concessions along the, the beach are, are managed by parks. The uh, current um, concessionaire from Beach 9 to Beach 50 has uh, two more seasons left in their contract. And the current concessionaire from Beach 50 West to Beach 149 is uh, starting a new, we have a new term, new concessionaire coming on this spring. Um, so everything on and adjacent to the, the boardwalk and on the sand itself is, is managed by parks concessions. Okay. And so with that, does, how does the administration plan to expand the concessions along the beachfront uh, of and adjacent to the project site? Um, so typically we'll work with the, with the concessionaire. We're just starting now to put together the RFP for the next term of the Eastern half of the beach concession. And we anticipate that, that we would be um, strongly encouraging the incoming concessionaire to uh, to develop better concession opportunities in in the beach 30 say the beach 30s area as part of the new term of uh, of their concession and that term will actually overlap or align pretty nicely with the construction of the Arvin East um, development that concession will be starting up as as construction is underway Okay, uh, what is the rationale for the low density residential use uh, along the waterfront uh, in the uh, flood zone? So I think we're looking, um, as I'd mentioned, at a variety of typologies. Um, and uh, I think really it, it's, a, it's a marketability issue. Um, and it seems that, you know, a home ownership opportunity being in close proximity to the beach in this location um, it is definitely very attractive. That said, um, as I mentioned, all of those um, houses would be raised up and out of the flood, floodplain to plus 16, which is four feet above what is currently required by code. Um, and what we're also trying to do is, in addition to that, tuck parking underneath some of these typologies to further raise um, the townhouses up to a higher elevation. Okay, thank you. Um, and what is the, 
the ratio of parking to residential use on the site? And are there any of the parking spaces um, going to be made available uh, for parking near the beach? Public parking. Yes, sorry, I have to take out my list. Um, so there is one parking space provided for every residential unit created. Um, there is also, and I think right now, we're looking at the current counts are over 1700 uh, parking spaces inclusive of uh, additional support, uh, support accessory parking lots for the nature preserve. Um, and in addition to that, there would be approximately 200 to 250 spaces uh, currently created um, on public streets that would be rebuilt. Thank you. Um, just a couple more questions here. Uh, if you could please outline uh, the ongoing community engagement uh, that will be conducted uh, if this ULIP application is approved. Sure, absolutely. So um, I think from a big picture standpoint, we will be kicking off um, community advisory board meetings actually next week on uh, March 3rd. Uh, we'll be meeting quarterly to discuss um, uh, large issues with the project associated with open space, economic development, um, things of that nature. And in, in addition to that, we um, have been continually, continually engaging um, CBOs and local organizations on a smaller basis, having conversations to um, either introduce ourselves or remind people that um, we're neighbors and uh, present the project and, and let them know where we are continually throughout the process. In addition to that, we have a project website and we'll have a communication strategy uh, which has multiple facets to it. One is obviously making sure our project website is up to date with all the current information. We're also looking to create um, a newsletter to update um, community members and residents about uh, updates on the project and also a listserv and email blast. So once activity um, commences on the site, people will know um, in real time what to expect, what is happening so there aren't any questions as to uh, what's going on, or if something, you know, if a bulldozer's on the site, people sh people will know why. Thank you. Um, and what kind of opportunities for the CLT creation exist on the Rockaway Peninsula? So I will, I'll take that. So. Within the Rockway Peninsula, you know, the, the agency is looking to advancing um, the opportunities for CLTs um, um, within the Rockaways. Um, it's not related to this project, but just related to this community, the agency will be um, bringing forth um, opportunities um, for, for, for the CLT concept um, um, in the form of, an, uh, of a request that's going to be released by, by the agency uh, to that effect. Um, and what are the plans for the Edgemere landfill? Uh, the, I can get back to you, Chair, on that. I don't have um, an appropriate response for that in front of me right now. Okay. Uh, Edgemere landfill? Yeah. Yes. Um, currently, Department of Sanitation is... Uh, still has jurisdiction over the decommissioning of the, the landfill portion. And they will be um, within the next couple of, within the next, not too far off, be uh, providing parks a draft of handover um, documentation um, so that we could look at ongoing, um, you know, the ongoing inspection and maintenance of the facility as, as it comes into recreational use. Uh, Mitchell or uh, Nick, any further detail? Yeah, thanks, Eric. Uh, I think you have that right. We are in a communication with sanitation as we have been for several years on moving towards the uh, change in landfill in use from closing up from inspection wise DEC and sanitation to transferring to a recreational facility. Uh, it's still in sanitation's court right now getting that uh, final end use report completed. And once we have that at parks, we'll keep working with them to come up with what the long-term recreation plan for that site is. Okay, so just so I'm clear, so the, the administration does feel uh, that this site could be remediated and made more suitable 
um, for public access in the future. Yes, that's what the report that sanitation is working on right now is potentially going to outline. Okay, thank you. Um, last question. Uh, the Rockaway Peninsula has uh, seen several major uh, redevelopment projects that have potential to bring thousands of new residents to the area. Uh, what kind of public transit improvements are being planned for the area? Um, and could you uh, please provide a list of those uh, planned improvements uh, to the subcommittee? Yes, um, I, we can definitely provide that to the subcommittee um, following this hearing. Um, including follow up with our with our sister agencies um, to the effect of those improvements um, to 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 public transit in the area. But do you not uh, have anything that you can share currently? I don't have in front of me um, what I can share with you. This, so this uh, so this site is is um, is accessible by two um, train stations. Um, well, I should actually just say to to the one um, on on Beach Thirty Thirty Fourth, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and I do not have any I do not have anything to report to the to the committee as well as far as um, improvements that are planned um, for that for that station. Well, this is very critical. So uh, I suggest you get this uh, to the committee as soon as possible. I will, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not saying that there isn't anything planned. What I'm saying is I'll be able to provide the, the committee um, by the end of the day today um, what those plans are. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, that's all the questions uh, I have. Um, I'd like to now uh, turn it over to our council to see if there's any council members uh, that have any questions uh, for this panel. Chair, council member Ayala has her hand raised for a question. Council member Ayala, whenever you're ready. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I apologize for the sound on my computer. It's a little bit low. Um, but my, I have two questions. You mentioned that 80% of the units are going to be affordable. Can you share, do you have that information yet, what the uh, the actual breakdown of those, uh, the affordable, the AMIs is? And uh, my second question is in relation to the number of proposed home ownership units. Are those the same as the CLT proposed units? Um, and how many units is that? Thank you, council member. Um, so it, it probably wasn't mentioned earlier, but we're looking at this project as a, as a, as a multi-phase project um, over a course of many years, um, with initially starting with the nature preserve and, and a lot of the infrastructure work that's needed. Um, so we are, not, we are not anticipating any of the housing to come online for a number of years. Um, but having said that, we are anticipating from at least the first phase of the affordable housing, um, looking at what if we were to look at current term sheets, um, looking at that those first phase within either one or two buildings to follow a model um, similar to what we have on our mix and match program, um, having units um, from a, a, a wide range of income tiers, um, you know, up to 50% of, of, of AMI all the way up to 100 to 130 percent of AMI, um, but again, th that that we're still in conversation stages for that. Since you know, any potential furtherance of that part of the project is not for a number of years out. And, and I believe there was a second part to your question uh, outside of the affordability, right? I think I think she might have been uh, the council member was asking about the RFEI that you mentioned earlier for CLTs. I believe in Edgemere. That's a separate, right, Kevin? It's a separate. Yes. Right. So, but and you also asked me about home, the home ownership right. component about, of this project. Yeah. So the so the so the um, the the three hundred and thirty or so market rate units um, will be um, a home ownership product that I can have the development team speak to a little bit more. Um, and so that's where uh, that that's where home ownership is. Um, also, in, in conversations with the community board, and understanding that there is a, a need for home ownership and affordable home ownership in this community. Um, the agency is working with our development partners to bring um, um, affordable home ownership um, to the project in the, out, in the later phases as well, in addition to you know, the, the market rate product. Okay. And that's separate and apart from the CLT? Correct. The CLT is a separate initiative that you know, hopefully I'll be speaking to, to the committee about at some time um, in the future soon. And how, how, far, how far off are we in terms of the construction of any potential uh, housing on any of these sites? 
I would I would gauge um in the three to five year ballpark. Um, looking at some of the faces of my development partners, I'm hoping. Sure. That... <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to, I wasn't sure who you were looking at. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, we're we're anticipating probably the first building wouldn't um, come online uh, just because it's a large building probably till 2024. That uh, would be the earliest, I think. Okay. Can you give a little bit of a description on the on the home ownership uh, unit? I think somebody was gonna break that down a little bit for me. Sure. So um, the the there's 330 anticipated um, market rate units as part of the project that are anticipated to be a for sale um, product. We're looking at these more as um, not necessarily luxury um, apartments, but very much attainable um, mid-market. Um, some of them will be smaller, so it would make for great starter homes, and some will be um, single family or also two family townhouses. So you could have a, a three bedroom, two bath, and a one bedroom that you could rent out as well. So I think we're looking at a mix of, of typologies on the uh, market rate side. That said, we, um, as Kevin mentioned, we are looking into and exploring home ownership opportunities as part of the um, affordable component, um, which we are definitely open to. And I think that will be subject to ongoing discussions with HPD and funding availability for, for that product. Yeah, I, 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 we, we have a serious demand for affordable housing, home ownership opportunities. And so it would be really nice if we have, if we have the, the, the land to develop it, um, to take that opportunity as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Ayala. Uh, Council, do we have any other council members um, that have any questions? No, Chair, I see no other members with questions for the panel. Okay. Uh, there being uh, no further questions, uh, the applicant panel is excused. Uh, council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on the uh, Arvern East application? Yes, Chair Moyer, there are approximately eight public witnesses who have signed up to speak for, excuse me, um, for members of the public here to testify, please note again that witnesses will generally be called in groups of four. When you hear your name, please stand by and prepare to speak when the chair says that you may begin. Please also note that once all panelists in your group have completed their testimony, you will be removed from the meeting as a group and the next group of speakers will be introduced. Once removed, participants may continue to view the live stream broadcast of this hearing on the council website. We will now hear from the first panel, which will include Queensboro President Donovan Richards. Thank you. Feels like old times. Good, Good morning. Morning. Chair Moya. All, yeah. all the land. Hi, Councilman Bayala. I miss all of y'all. <laughs> um, so, so good to see you all. And I just wanted to start off by um, thanking HBD and, and, and all of the development team for um, certainly taking some, some early steps to, to listen to the community, but obviously there's still a lot more work that, that needs to be done. And I mean, you're, you're aware that we sent in uh, obviously our approval of this project, but also had some concerns with that as well that we, we certainly would love to see ironed out um, prior to this application, possibly being approved by the next um, council person and, and, and obviously this committee. Um, so I, I just wanna start by saying, I certainly support uh, the Auburn East project as someone who lived across the street from this site as well. I can tell you that it's, it's been a, a stain on the community for a very long time. Uh, and it's about time we do something about it. Um, from my time in the council not that long ago, I have personally been very interested in seeing this project move forward. Uh, as it was discussed on the line, and I wanna thank you chair for, for bringing up many good points. Um, the east end of the Rockaway Peninsula for too long has lagged in the progress and growth experience across other parts of the peninsula in Queens. I see this project as part of the catalyst that will help fill some of the need for affordable to moderate housing, provide new community centers that will nurture and inspire the residents who feel forgotten, bring some new economic and cultural activity into the neighborhood, and as importantly, upgrades to the infrastructure and open space around Auburn East. 
I've outlined a number of conditions that will make the project better while meeting the needs that were expressed by area residents. These include one, something you mentioned, Mr. Chair, the closure of hospitals and, and healthcare facilities in the Rockaways has created a situation that often requires residents to leave the peninsula for primary and critical health care and services. And we really need to see an H and H at in the Rockaways. And I know we've been talking to the deputy mayor's office about this, but we need to see something substantial. We all know what happened through this pandemic. Um, you know, this was an area that saw uh, uh, one of the highest death rates in the city outside of your district, uh, Chair Moya. Um, so we we clearly those disparities in healthcare are something that we need to address as a city, especially as we see an increase in population. And we know that St. John's Hospital is the only hospital on the peninsula. In addition to the need for new healthcare and trauma facilities, there is a great need for children's and senior care services and generally community programs for residents in the area. Community centers are needed immediately to service the existing and future residents of Auburn and Edgemere. And I'm very happy that the developers have at least taken the first step uh, and saying that they, they are gonna commit to doing a community center, but we need to see some community planning around that sooner than later. A school was included in the original Auburn plan and a dire need for quality educational facilities has not changed. Along with new schools, the Department of Education should commit $20 million for investment in upgrading the technology and equipment in existing and any new schools that are proposed in the future. Uh, I know that the developers are working with Local 79, so I'm very happy that uh, there will be union jobs here. Uh, but in addition to that, we need to ensure that they're meeting their mark on 30% MWBE goals and local hiring. And I know the development has sent a commitment letter over on that already. Edgemere Avenue, you spoke of as well, Mr. Chair. You know, I'm very happy that HPD has put some money in the budget to at least get the preliminary planning process started. But we need to see a, a real commitment in, in, in the budget um as we pass this and and i know we were in a budget crunch and we anticipate some money now coming from washington i'm hoping that uh you know that money there will be money set aside to really widen the lanes and i two last things i want to talk about uh is beach access and the piping clovers we've had a lot of conversations with the parks department and many of the city agencies this is a neighborhood that is on that is beachfront property but the residents don't have access to the beach and the city needs to figure this out. We've been talking about this for 20, 30 years. And it's, it's really a shame that black and brown communities on the Eastern portion of the Rockaways have a beach that they can't use because the Parks Department has not figured this out. So I wanna be very strong on this point. It's about time that we come up with a plan for the residents, low-income residents to have access to their beach just like everybody else. Um, and then on the Edgemere landfill, uh, I would love to see an RFEI on that. On that, you know, this is a, a a prime place we could do we could do a solar farm on Edgemere landfill. Think about sustainability, resiliency, and what we need to make sure um, we do as as we move forward to make sure the Rockaways can survive um, in a, in the event of, more, of what we know is going to be the impacts of climate change. Um, with that being said, the last thing I'll say is uh, commitment to a community advisory board uh, should be done, uh, which, which should be comprised of the local community board, local community and civic organizations, and then relevant government and elected officials as well for the duration of the project. All of these conditions and more are identified in my recommendations. In the interest of time, I will not go through the other 40 that we put out there, but however, I will answer any questions if you have any, but I wanna thank you for allowing me uh, this opportunity. I really do wanna thank the city for their commitment to Far Rockaway as well. Uh, we were out yesterday, we cut the ribbon on a new uh, 200 unit affordable housing project um, with retail and daycare. And I know RDRC was there to really, when we talk about where do we need to go as a city, uh, the Rockaways is certainly <laughs> um, ahead of the curve. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, continuing the transformation of the Rockaways with everyone. So thank you, Mr. Chair. I took up a long enough time. Surprised you didn't give me a buzzer. No, no. Thank you, Mr. Board President. I know how hard you worked on this project uh, and how much this means to you and uh, everyone out in the, the Rockaways. So thank you uh, again for uh, your hard work on this. Thank you, sir.
Uh, okay, but uh, just a quick reminder before we go to uh, the members of the public. Um, I want to remind them that members of the public will be given uh, two minutes to speak. And please do not begin until the Sergeant at Arms uh, has started the clock. Uh, so, Council, if you could please call up the uh, first witness. Chair, um, excuse me, if you want to excuse. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Is yes. Present? Yes. All right. The first. Uh, the first panel for this item will include Kevin Alexander, Marcus Bennett, Jessica Ortiz, and Tiffany Lunk. Uh, as a technical note, uh, Jessica Ortiz, um, we just wanna make sure that it, that it is Jessica Ortiz who's going to be appearing on this panel. Uh, um, we understand that there may be some issue with the login. Oh. Uh, nevertheless, Jessica Ortiz will be on this panel. The first speaker on the panel will be Kevin Alexander, followed by Marcus Burnett. Time begins now. Ready. Good morning and thank you for the opportunity. Rockway Development and Revitalization Corporation is supportive of the Auburn East Development Project and the zoning amendments that are necessary to jumpstart the project. Our support is based on the underlying principle that guides RDRC, improving the quality of life for its residents. The two zoning amendments will activate the development project by initi initiating the transformation of vacant land into a beautiful nature preserve for the community to enjoy and our youth to explore and engage and learn more about the ecological environmental challenges facing their generation and to explore careers in those respective fields as well. The second amendment will enable a local business, Rockway Brewery, with a proven track record in job creation and retention, community support, and to expand and create not only jobs, but potential new career pathways in microbrewing. While RDOC does recognize the need to create home ownership opportunities, better transportation, street widening, a possible hospital, educational facility and the inclusion of MWBE and local businesses in the economic revitalization of the East End of the Rockaways, the development team uh, that represents the Auburn East project have been very open, transparent and want to be inclusive in terms of community support and engagement. So with that, RDOC is supportive of the overall project and moving the two amendments forward. Thank you. The next speaker is Marcus Burnett, who will be followed by Jessica Ortiz. Time begins now. Hi, I'm Marcus Burnett, uh, representing Rockway Brewing Company. I'm one of the partners. Um, I'm here to uh, speak in support of this project. Um, we've been um, happily uh, located on Beach 72nd Street for the past six years. We operate a tap room uh, for our microbrewery there. Um, we employ local residents. We had uh, zero incidents at our bar there. Um, we um, have also used our space there to create um, community engagement. We have Rockway Buyers Club, the Maker's Market. We, uh, this spring during COVID, we operated a Walk Rockway Food Initiative where we delivered um, more than 8,000 meals to local residents and first responders. We also run an incubator kitchen, which gives opportunity to locals to develop their skills at um, cooking and starting their own businesses. Um, so <clears throat> we have a track record of already operating in uh, Rockaway Peninsula, and we're very excited to be part of this new Arvin East uh, development. We um, are looking to expand our small manufacturing project on 35th Street. Uh, we are planning on the Rockwood Brewing Company has had and will continue to seek sustainable, efficient practices and environmental social consciousness with a new location built from the ground up with l and and their partners. We seek to install state-of-the-art equipment um, and create jobs in, in Rockway. Uh, it is a small manufacturing. It doesn't, it's a pretty low impact process. And so we'll have two components. One will be manufacturing, creating jobs there, as well as a tap room where we 
hope to continue bringing the community, creating space for the residents in this new development to enjoy. And we're really excited to be partners in this and hopefully um, be part of it when it starts. Thank you very much. And the next and last speaker on this panel will be Jessica Ortiz. Hi, Jessica, good to see you. Time right. begins. I, good morning, Chair Moya. It is so nice to see you too. Uh, good morning to you and the members of the subcommittee. My name is Jessica Ortiz and I am a representative of 32BJ. I am here today on behalf of more than 600 members that live and work in Community District 14 and the 80,000 building service workers that 32BJ represents across the five boroughs. 32BJ is here today to express our support for Arvern East. 32BJ has a long partnership with LNM, one of the developers of this project. LNM is a responsible developer and they have worked towards a commitment to prevailing wage building service jobs at these sites. These are the kinds of jobs that will help New York City recover from the economic aftermath of the COVID pandemic and bring family sustaining wages and benefits to the local community. Additionally, 32BJ strongly supports the creation of much needed affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Chair, that was the last speaker for this first panel. Okay, um, thank you all for your testimony today. Um, the council, is there um, uh, any other members uh, of the public who wish to testify on the uh, Arvern East proposal? Yes, sir, we have a second panel. Uh, the second, the next panel will include Tiffany Lonk and De Deneen Ferguson, Tiffany Lonk and Deneen Ferguson. First speaker will be Tiffany Lonk. Time begins now. Hello, good, good afternoon. My name is Tiffany Lonk and I'm the volunteer coordinator for the Fra Rockaway Avern nonprofit coalition known as Frank. This statement is on behalf of the membership. Frank is in complete support of the Avern East project as long as the element development, the development team, and NYC agencies have plans to address the need for infrastructure improvements and opportunities for our existing businesses and livable wage employment and home ownership for qualified residents. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker will be Deneen Ferguson. Time begins now. Good morning. Uh, Chair Moyer and to the other quality members of this city council committee. Uh, my name is Deneen Ferguson and I, I represent the Queens Recovery and Resiliency Committee. That's part of the Far Rockaway Arbor Nonprofit Coalition. Uh, we are uh, cumulatively in favor of the project. Uh, I am a over 30 year resident on the peninsula and my home is in close proximity to this project personally, and I've seen nothing in that space for over 30 years. And so we're looking forward to a great project. And also we've already had meetings with the development team, especially around uh, workforce, um, uh, making sure that the local residents are not just getting jobs, but have an opportunity to work and train towards careers and truly sustainable um, livelihoods. And uh, we also have found that the development company or the development team has been responsive to uh, many of our requests and our suggestions and comments. So we will continue to work in tandem with them and the remainder of the community and our elected officials to make sure that this project is beneficial to most everyone. Thank you. That was the last speaker on this panel, Chair Moya. Okay, thank you. Thank you uh, all for your testimony uh, today. Now, is there um, anyone uh, else wishing to testify? Uh, if there are any other members of the public who wish to testify on um, the Arvern East proposal, 
uh, please press the raise hand button now. The meeting will briefly stand at ease, Chair. I believe we do have one additional witness. Okay. Chair, we have an additional witness. The next speaker will be Alexis Foote. Alexis Foot. Time begins now. Alexis, you may begin. Sorry, we, we are having some technical issues. Alexis is in the process. Uh, we do expect uh, her to testify, just waiting to complete her registration and bring her into the meeting. Okay, thank you. Hello, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Hello, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Alexis, we can hear you. Can you hear us, Alexis? Hello. Hi, Alexis. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Hi, hi, everyone. Hi, um, thank you for allowing me to speak. I am for the Auburn View Project. The only thing is that they need to build all of the amenities first. Like they need to build the brewery first. We are already a natural preserve. The MT, the EMTs, the cops, everybody uses that space. We have created our own parking in that space. Right now, they need to build the structure. They need to make sure the MTA structure is good. I worked for a prestigious hospital, and one morning, I didn't know how I was going to get out of here because they had closed the subway system on me. Yes, we have the ferry, but I live on the east side of the peninsula. There's a lot of racial injustice. In, in on the east side of peninsula and there needs to be more opportunity as far as farmland some of the, that that land needs to be put into farmland not so much a nature preserve especially now that governor cuomo is allowing um hemp to be grown in new york state and i think there needs to be a skating rink in a movie theater not only just the brewery thank you thank you thank you for your uh, testimony um, let me check with our council to see if there's any other members of the public who wish to testify on this item. If there are any other members of the public who wish to testify on the Arvern East proposal, please, pl please press the raise hand button now. And the meeting will briefly stand at ease once more while we check for our members of the public. Chair Moya, I see no members of the public, uh, no additional members of the public who wish to testify on this item. Okay, thank you. Uh, there being no members of the public who wish to testify on the uh, Arburn East proposal under ULERP numbers C210070 uh, ZMQ and N210071 ZRQ, N210069 uh, HNQ, the public hearing is now closed and this item is laid over. I now uh, would like to open the public hearing on the pre-considered LU items for the uh, 737 4th Avenue rezoning proposal under ULERP's number C200029ZMK and N0 and N200030ZRK uh, uh, relating to property in Council Member Menchaca's district in Brooklyn. Uh, the, propose, the proposal seeks a rezoning um, map amendment 
The proposal seeks a zoning uh, map amendment to change an M1 uh, 1D district to an R 8A C24 district and to extend the existing special uh, EC1 uh, enhanced commercial district as well as a related zoning text amendment to establish a new mandatory inclusionary housing area on the east side of the 4th Avenue uh, between uh, 25th and 26th Street in the Sunset Park neighborhood of Brooklyn. Uh, the proposed action would facilitate the development of a 14-story mixed-use building with approximately 142 dwelling units, 35 of which would be affordable, and ground floor commercial use. Um, before we hear from the applicant. Uh, I would like to uh, give my colleague, uh, Council Member Menchaca, an opportunity uh, to make some remarks. We're going to get you unmuted in a second. There we go. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Moya. And thank you to the members of this committee, the applicants, uh, those here that are going to testify on this application. I hope you're all well and safe at home. Uh, I now for years have been extremely critical of land use processes that this council has inherited uh, from years of creation. It was built with a deep commitment to developer deference. What we need is a comprehensive and inclusive planning process to replace Euler, something that can empower our communities with tools, with superb language access tools with lawyers and with information like racial impact studies to make the best decisions for their neighborhood and to connect it to citywide goals. We need it for a just and a recover, uh, equitable recovery from COVID and beyond. Because ULERP is flawed, I have conditioned my support for rezonings on requiring developers to go beyond what is required by the law. And I'm pleased that the developers of 737 Fourth Avenue have been responsive to Community Board 7 and the coalition of organizations who have come together to talk about the needs of the community. Uh, and what I'm hearing is a signatured, um, a signed CBA. I'm even more pleased that the developer signed a fully ex executed CBA this week before the public hearing and included provisions to allow the community board to hold them and any future owner of this site accountable. This will give us a unique opportunity to review um, the terms of the CBA openly, and I thank them for their commitment to the transparency and the dialogue. Uh, I look forward to testimony. I have a lot of questions for the applicant, and I know that our community members and neighbors will be testifying. So thank you, Chair, for this time, and I look forward to uh, their testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Um, Council, if you can please call uh, the first panel for this item. The applicant panel includes Tucker Reed, Vivian Liao, Elizabeth Canella on behalf of the Totem Group, and Jay Marcus appearing on behalf of the Fifth Avenue Committee, and Eric Palatnik, Land Use Council uh, for the applicant. Also on hand for question and answer support are Jason Diaz, and Baksar Srivastava. Panelists, if you have not already done so, please accept the unmute request in order to begin to speak. Thank you. Uh, okay. Chair, is it okay if I proceed? All right, before you begin, uh, Council, if you can um, please administer the affirmation. Panelists, please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? Yes. Good yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have received your slides for presentation for this proposal. Uh, and when you're ready uh, for it to be shown, please say so, and it will be displayed on the screen by our staff. Slides will be advanced when you stay next. Uh, please note that there may be slight delay in both the initial loading and the advancing of slides. Uh, once again, anyone who requires an accessible version of this presentation uh, may send an email request to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. And now if the panelists would uh, please restate uh, your names and affirmation for the record, uh, you may begin. Eric Palatnik. Vivian Liao. Vivian Liao. Uh, 
Tuckery. Jay Elizabeth Marcus. Canella. Oh, hey, thank you. Thank you. Bhaskar Srivastava with Density Works. And Jason Diaz with Philip Abib and Associates. With that as the introduction, uh, I guess I'll start speaking. This is Eric Palatnik. Uh, I'll make a brief introduction and I'll hand it over to Totem to speak and, and Mr. Marcus. Uh, I wanted to say thank you to the entire committee as well as to Councilman Manchaka. Uh, your introduction was spot on. Uh, you set the bar very high and I think that the team has stepped up to it. And I'm, I, for one, am proud to see a development in front of this committee that is highly responsive to both the social economic and housing needs of a community. And I think it could serve as a great model for what a private developer could do in the public realm without any government money at all. Uh, in this application, just as an overview, we're asking the committee to approve the extension of an R8A C24 zoning district, which runs along 4th Avenue to this site that is improved upon right now for those who haven't been there with a one-story Dunkin' Donuts with a drive-through. It looks like it would be better situated in suburban New Jersey and intensely populated in New York City. It rests above the subway station. The applicant has listened to what Councilman Machaca has said, the community board and the borough president, and with the help of Jay Marcus, has worked to create an, an MIH development that targets 40% of the units at 30% of the AMI and an average of 46% AMI, which is an extremely low AMI level for a privately funded application. There will be no studios. It'll be all family sized units. There'll be jobs created. We've worked with a bunch of local job creation groups to provide diverse jobs, both in the operation of the building, including 32 BJ and groups such as that, and in the building of the building. And the affordability is to be administered by Jay Marcus and the Fifth Avenue Committee, who I think everybody in Brooklyn knows to be a well-trusted and respected organization. With respect to the MTA, we've agreed to give away an easement space for the MTA to allow for handicapped access to the subway station that's below. And in addition, we have agreed to enter into, as the councilman has said, and we've entered into it already, a community benefits agreement that holds us to our words on every single promise and commitment that you're about to hear. So we thank you very much for allowing us, and especially Councilman Machaca, we, we know that, that you have very strong opinions and we, we really hope that we've fashioned an application that both you and all the other uh, council people can bring back to their communities and show that they stuck up for what's right. Uh, with that is the app, with that is the presentation, Tucker Reed from Totem uh, would like to speak. I'm actually gonna turn it over to my colleague, Vivian Leo. Yes, and we can I go ahead and, first. that's okay. We can bring up the presentation now. And uh, with, with that time, I'll also just echo what Eric said and, and thank the, um, Council Member Menchaca for the comments and introduction, as well as uh, to Chair Moya and the subcommittee for the opportunity to present on this project. My name is Vivian Liao. Again, I'm one of the principals of TOTEM. You'll also be hearing from my partner, Tucker Reed, and our project manager, Liz Canella. We are proud to present what has been the result of years of engagement with the community, inclu including the council member's office, to create precedent-setting benefits for Sunset Park. Totem is a small Brooklyn-based real estate firm, which we started five years ago, bringing our collective experience in government, urban design, and real estate to focus on local projects that benefit neighborhoods. The common thread tying our projects together is the approach we take to centering the voices of communities in which we work. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry, I forgot to say that previously. Next slide. Our approach to development starts with identifying an opportunity or challenge. Then we do our research. We spend time listening with, to the community, engaging with the community, and then partner with them to develop collaborative solutions that can help meet neighborhood needs. That's exactly the process we've taken here in this project. We spent the past two years working with the community and meeting with local stakeholders. And as was introduced earlier, we are very proud to say that we recently completed a community benefits agreement that reflects precedent setting accomplishments that will benefit the neighborhood in regard to affordable housing, job creation, neighborhood infrastructure improvements that you'll be hearing about more shortly. But first, let me introduce the project itself. If you can go to the next slide. The opportunity that we are talking about here, next slide, 
Yep. Is an underbuilt fast food chain and parking lot that sits right on top of a transit node in a neighborhood that is facing a housing crisis. Without using public funds, we can bring approximately 135 units of new housing to the neighborhood, one in four of which will be permanently affordable to the residents who live here. Next slide. Why is this so important? As you can see here from data that was pulled together by the Fifth Avenue Committee in a report they released last year, Sunset's, Sunset Park's population continues to grow and rents continue to rise. But on the next slide, you'll see housing production has not kept pace. Since 2014, a little more than a thousand housing units uh, have gotten built in the community board district. Only 10% of those were affordable. That's 108 units. For a little context, our one project alone would represent one of the first MIH project, projects in this district and a more than 30% increase of all the affordable units built in the district over the last six years. Next slide. Clearly the housing crisis is a pervasive issue which isn't going to be solved by just one project, which is why Fifth Avenue Committee proposed a number of recommendations to tackle it, ranging from preserving the existing housing stock to building 100% affordable projects on government owned land. On the next slide, you see where our project fits in. Um, uh, if you go back one slide, captured by yep, point three here, through the city's mandatory inclusionary housing program, without any city subsidy, we can bring 35 permanently affordable apartments online to start tackling the housing crisis now. Inclusionary zoning was created to build mixed income housing in neighborhoods that desperately need it. And this project is the quintessential example of how the program should work. All we need to move forward on this is a rezoning of the block on which the site sits. And I'm gonna turn it over to my partner Tucker now to go into more of those details. Thank you, next slide please. Uh, just for context on the actual uh, rezoning application, what originally drew us to this site was the proximity to an existing R8A overlay on 4th Avenue that terminates one block to the north of our site, as you can see on the zoning map here. We're currently zoned M11D and the R8A overlay could be extended one block. Next slide, please. Uh, extended one block face to pick up these two parcels, the Dunkin' Donuts. We also own, um, but there are some existing retail leases on the lots in years to come, although it would uh, represent an additional 15 or so affordable units that could be constructed there down the road. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we worked very hard, as my colleagues have mentioned here, over the last two years uh, in conversations with the local community board to really be respectful of the context and density along 4th Avenue. Uh, you'll see here in this graphic, our building is highlighted in yellow, making sure that we're not violating that kind of 140 foot height um, precedent that has been set up and down 4th Avenue, um, even you know, responding to neighborhood concerns about not being higher than the church steeple across the street or the uh, Greenwood Heights Cemetery entrance up the hill. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see how the same kind of nestling effect takes place as we move from the waterfront uh, um, uh, up, up the hill on 25th Street and again, how the building is very respectful of the contextual precedent that's been set before us. Next slide, please. Uh, there was a lot of conversation in the neighborhood over many years about the historic view corridor from Greenwood Heights Cemetery out to the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor. Uh, it's a kind of sanctified uh, view corridor in this neighborhood. So we made sure that our building will not violate that view corridor, that the Statue of Minerva will always be able to see her friend Lady Liberty out in the harbor. Next slide, please. And uh, the views from, you know, the kind of cherished vistas from uh, Sunset Park proper of Lower Manhattan, again, will not be impacted by this development site. Next slide, please. Um, so in the end, what we'll end up with here by that R8A extension is approximately uh, 108,000 square feet of development and rights, 135 dwelling units, 35 of which would be permanently affordable. Um, we've also, it's a response to the housing crisis in the neighborhood. It is transit oriented development built, being built on top of an R train station and helps to alleviate um, some of the, the, the push on Sunset Park's housing stock, which is some of the oldest in New York City as little new housing development has taken place here over the last few decades. Next slide, please. 
We've worked um, to kind of design a building that is respectful also from a materiality standpoint of the surrounding context. Next slide, please. So you'll see the ground floors of the building are really uh, contemplated as a terracotta finish that kind of blends into the brownstone character of the neighborhood around us. And then as we move higher up into the building, more glass and steel that gets lost in the uh, skyline. Next slide, please. Um, we have been, uh, we've made kind of sustainability measures a, a front and center um, effort in this design as well. It's a priority that was uh, tasked to us by uh, borough, the borough president as well as the council member's office. And so throughout this design incorporates green roofs. Uh, we are uh, contemplating bioswales and rain catchment um, um, infrastructure in the uh, street and uh, as well as sidewalk widenings and, and um, traffic calming measures around the site to make it more pedestrian friendly for the entrance to the 25th Street R train station. Next slide, please. Um, that R train station, we were approached by the MTA during the rezoning process about providing an easement to them to be able to come back and build an elevator access to the R train track here uh, in the future. Obviously our project is such smallest scale cannot support the capital cost of 20 to $30 million to build this elevator ourselves. Um, but we have uh, given the land, we will be transferring the land for free over to the MTA for uh, this easement access uh, in a future date when they require it. And in the interim, our community benefits agreement uh, contemplates a coalition of local CBOs who will help us to program this space to show the wares of local entrepreneurs, uh, local small businesses, et cetera. Next slide, please. Um, we've also made commitments around local retail. Uh, much of Fourth Avenue does not have a retail president present in new construction. And so we've agreed uh, as part of the zoning action, we've asked for the ability to have ground floor retail transparency and to carve the spaces up into smaller space to really cater to mom and pop businesses in the neighborhood. Next slide, please. Um, finally, we worked with a, a, um, an emerging um, entrepreneur in Brooklyn um, called Uni, uh, which is a bike parking, um, secure private bike parking um, amenity that will be the first um, experiment in incorporating this amenity into the building. As you can see, the public will have access off of the street to this bike parking, and uh, it will also serve the uh, um, residents of the building, but this will be the first public accessible uh, uh, private, uh, <laughs> private, privately secured uh, bike parking station on top of the subway station in New York City. Um, next slide, please. I'm going to turn it over now to my colleague Elizabeth Cannell. Hi, everyone. So one of the first concerns, the community, the community board and the council council member, as he just stated, uh, was the projects need to go um, to offer affordable housing at 30% of AMI, uh, which is a lot more in line with Sunset residents averaging about $40,000 for a family. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> I'm back. Um, so yes, knowing this, we took the off-the-shelf MIH program and modified it to better suit the needs of the neighborhood. So working with the Fifth Avenue Committee, we developed an affordable housing program that represents income ranges between 30 and 60 percent of AMI, which is that pink box around the light blue that you see, um, meaning individuals making $15 an hour uh, would qualify. Next slide, please. Uh, what these AMI means is that we're able to build approximately 35 permanently affordable homes with rents ranging from anywhere from $500 to $1,600 a month. Um, and again, this is without government subsidy. This is compared to over 100 affordable, affordable units built in Community Board 7 uh, in the last six, six years or so, as Vivian mentioned. Next slide. So across the city, which many of you know, um, more common MIH programs normally achieve an average of 60 to 80% of AMI. Here we capped the AMIs to receive to achieve a lower percentage of 46% of AMI. So, and that we're aware of is the lowest AMI average that an MIH project has ever achieved with 
vouch no subsidy. And that's those percentage points are significant. It means reducing the monthly rents by 300 to $600 a month, depending on the income band, which you see on the comparison here. Next slide, please. So this project builds on a recent precedent set in the district. As you can see in the first column in 2018, the project was approved at 60% of AMI with no modifications. More recently, within a mile radius of, the, of, of our project, MIH projects were approved at an average of 80% of AMI. We knew that these affordability levels were not acceptable to Community Board 7. So working together with the council member and Community Board 7, we were able to bring, to get, to bring an AMI average way down from the precedent set a couple years ago uh, with similar rezoning in this district. And just like these precedents, our project was, over, was approved overwhelmingly by a local community board, the borough president and city planning. Next slide, please. So we're very excited to say uh, we have signed a legally binding community benefits agreement that cements all the commitments we've shared today and memori memorializes the conditions from the community board and borough president approvements, ap approvals. So this includes setting aside 40% of the affordable units to 30% of AMI households, a 35% local and MWBE goal on hiring and contracts, first of its kind publicly accessible bike parking and MTA easement at no cost to the MTA, as well as a commitment to program that interim space with local businesses and makers and many more commitments, again, all achieved without government subsidy. Next slide, please. Stewards of this CBA include organizations that have served the area for decades, including Opportunities for a Better Tomorrow, SBIDC, Brooklyn Workforce Innovations. This, this CBA accompanies our agreement with 32BJ to operate the building. And then, as we said, an MTA agreement for the easement um, and a very important affordable housing marketing focus in CB7 led by Fifth Avenue Committee. So to close this out, I'm gonna kick it off to Jay Marcus, um, Director of Housing Development at Fifth Avenue Committee. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, yeah, Fifth Avenue Committee was very gl glad to be uh, invited by uh, the Tucker and his team to be part of this project. Um, it really does make um, things like CBAs, Community Benefit Agreements, which we very often do, um, to try to get above and beyond what zoning requires. It made it a lot easier to work with the developer who very much wanted to, to meet the goals of the community. The 30% AMI, which is always a priority for our nonprofit given who we work with, um, but also as a priority of the community board um, and the council member uh, to get to the lower incomes, to always fashion the AMI levels for any specific project to meet what the community um, AMI is not necessarily what the, um, the New York City regional um, AMI is, and also to go above and beyond on issues like energy conservation, which again, also in some ways helps affordability because you're saving on utility costs in the long term, which are some of the drivers that make it difficult to maintain if, when we do 100% affordable, affordable housing in the long term and is, is a problem for any, um, any management company. So um, we appreciate that. We appreciate also that they met a lot of the other community goals directly, particularly on the jobs front, as well as on setting aside a portion of the retail space, um, the MTA space, uh, while it's not being used for the MTA, for uh, nonprofit or for other community benefits and for subdividing the spaces, um, for the retail spaces, to be more compatible with the community needs. Uh, we do think, um, as, as Eric mentioned, and that the council member mentioned that this does very much meet the needs of the community. We're also very lucky in CB7, the, under the leadership of John Ventillas, who's the head of the uh, land use committee for CB7, uh, that they're very good at meeting, at understanding, hearing the community and making sure that their requests from developers meets the needs of the community. And actually the CBA, the Community Benefits Agreement, very much um, is in line with what the Community Board 7 had, had adopted in its resolution for this project and what uh, John and, and his team together on the Community Board had focused on. So we are excited in the long term. We're gonna be working with um, Opportunities for Better Tomorrow 
Book Commercial Source Innovation, 32BJ, SBIDC. And then even though I believe they're not gonna be part of the, the CBA, Sunset Park Business Improvement District to really help the developer both to meet those goals and other goals that they've stated, in, including to try to find the local mom and pop businesses that could use the space um, to be able to um, outreach, to make sure we reached community members uh, to help them apply for this. Uh, the community board has, has very often spoken to us on this and other projects about the need to help people to prepare for the lottery. Most council members are probably familiar that the lottery does require a lot of documentation uh, that for some individuals is difficult. So we, we are gonna be having staff specifically dedicated towards that, um, towards helping people to put that together. Um, and we, we also uh, will be working with them to try to uh, make sure they achieve the 35% local employee goals that they've articulated here. So again, we do think this is a model. It really helps a lot when you have a developer who says that they want to, one of their missions as a developer is to meet the needs of the local community. It makes uh, uh, the CBAs um, a lot easier and we really appreciate the partnership um, with the development team um, and, and look forward to making this project happen. Thank you. I think that summarizes our team, our presentation. Okay, thank you. So um, a couple of questions. Uh, before I um, go to um, Council Member Menchaca, um, particularly on the development site, um, when did you purchase this property and how did you identify it as a development opportunity? Tucker, would you like to answer that? Tucker Reed will answer that. Sorry, Council Member, I was muted. Um, we purchased the site, um, the first site about three years ago, the additional site uh, a little while after that. Um, and, you know, as we talked about in the, the presentation, I think what really drew us to the site was the kind of very um, strong grounding and urban planning um, for the extension of an existing zoning district, just one block face to uh, uh, address a, a very underutilized site in Brooklyn, right? It's very rare that you find a parking lot on top of a subway station. And I think the opportunity to uh, redevelop that site to enhance the neighborhood and bring some significant affordability to the neighborhood along the way is, is what our motivation was. Okay. And how did you determine that the uh, R, R8A um, was the appropriate density uh, to propose? Yeah, we went through a very extensive process with both city planning uh, and the local community board. Um, quite frankly, height was, was and density, um, though discussed, was not really... Uh, much of an issue in our discussions over the years once it was established that we weren't violating the view corridors and i think there was an understanding of you know a lower density a building here uh, would result in less units um, which you know when you're when you're really looking at a building across the street of the same height and density um, that it wasn't as big as, as much of an issue as you might find in other areas and and let's just say what what happens if uh the site uh if the proposed rezoning is not approved what would yeah, the, thank you. Yeah, the existing zoning is fairly restrictive on the site uh, in terms of, of height and density. Um, there is potentially one additional FAR of, of development rights there. So conceivably in the future, um, maybe an opportunity to build a, an additional story of retail, but uh, given the cost of construction and the current uses there, it's unlikely. What's, what's more likely to happen would be uh, the extension of the existing leases there um, until you know such time as the question could be revisited or uh, an additional uh, higher and best use was uh, presented. Okay. Um, which uh, MIH option uh, do you propose for the development and why? So we proposed MIH option one, um, which is the, I believe the 25% of the development at 60% of AMI, um, at an average of 60% of AMI. Um, you know, we proposed that option because it was the uh, lowest AMIs that were available to us and the kind of as of right programs. Um, and as you can see, hopefully in the result of the presentation, 
we took that off the shelf option and really modified it down um, to uh, agree to a range of AMIs from 30 to 60% of AMI. You know, the average household income of Community Board 7 was around $40,000 a year. So a 60% AMI average was not in keeping with the needs of the neighborhood and, and hence the, the desire to try to modify down uh, the AMIs as, as far as we possibly could without, without any government subsidy, uh, which we did seek repeatedly over the course of two years and was never made available to us. Um, and still sticking with that, like, so what motivated you uh, to propose affordable housing at a deeper affordability uh, than normally required? Well, because we're trying to help the community set a precedent here, right? I mean, we, we the way we approach our company, you know, all of us are, are former public servants or coming out of, uh, you know, public private development practices. And, and our goal is, as, as a company was to engage in kind of community-based development um, as much as we possibly could. And so uh, when we sat down, you know, with the community board early, we had five public hearings as part of our community board process. Uh, a, few, a number of sessions even before certification and a few afterwards. And so we really tried to intuit and hear what, from the neighborhood what the desire was uh, on the affordability uh, levels and then try to craft a private sector solution to deliver that. I mean, what we're, we're trying to do as a company is to you know, create precedents that we can be proud of and that we can show, you know, if a small development team like Totem can achieve uh, these outcomes uh, and potentially you know, share the benefits that are created by the uh, powerful tool of a change in density with the neighborhoods that we're working in. That's what we're trying to achieve. Great, so how will uh, these commitments to deeper affordability uh, be memorialized? Yeah, so um, we have uh, obviously our regulatory agreement with HPD, uh, which my understanding is that the commitments that we made both in letter form to the borough president and happy to do to the council here um, you know, HPD will be looking to memorialize those commitments within our regulatory agreement, uh, but we have also now executed a community benefits agreement uh, with the four organization, local organizations that we discussed that clearly articulates these affordable housing commitments and their ability to hold our feet to the fire by taking a restrictive deck against the building. Okay. And how do you respond to those uh, from the community who believe that the development should include more than 25% uh, percent of its units as affordable housing in order to truly benefit uh, the surrounding area? Um, listen, we would, we would have loved to go above 25%, uh, you know, and had, had we worked within higher AMIs, we probably could have achieved, right? There's options at 30% or potentially higher at higher AMIs. And we, we could have worked within those constraints if that had been the stated desire of the neighborhood. Uh, but we heard repeatedly to try to get the AMIs down as low as we possibly could. And, and as along with that, also providing larger units. So I think, you know, we mentioned the fact that we've illuminated all studio apartments from this uh, uh, building, even on the market rate side, uh, in an effort to create more family sized units, uh, which is really the need of the neighborhood. And also to prevent, you know, kind of further forces of gentrification with you know, younger professionals moving into the neighborhood that don't necessarily have ties to the area. And so the combination of larger units and deep affordability didn't allow us to push above 25% uh, without government subsidy. Okay. Um, with the commercial space, uh, parking and transit, all that, what type of tenants do you envision uh, for the ground floor commercial space? Yeah, we're excited to work with the local CBOs, um, you know, ranging from the local business improvement district that's a little outside, this is outside of their district. Um, um, but, you know, I think they'd be happy to work with us on retail referrals as well as, you know, the signatories to the CBA, like Opportunities for a Better Tomorrow in Southwest Brooklyn Industrial Development Corporation. I mean, we've purposely designed the ground floor. First of all, there's not a lot of space on the ground floor once you include the easement and the parking access, um, but to craft, uh, carve those spaces up into smaller footprints of between like 1,000 to 5,000 square feet, uh, which really accommodate uh, smaller businesses that are able to afford the rents at those um, smaller space uh, um, uh, requirements. Okay, um, so why does the development uh, propose more parking spaces, 52, uh, than actually required by zoning, which is 43? It's a request of the community board seven. Okay. Uh, and what is the benefit to the public uh, for providing the MTA um, an easement to build a future station entrance? Um, we've heard from advocates across the city that are uh, uh, advocates for uh, ADA accessibility 
safety on subway stations. Uh, with and um, many, I think we'll hear from some of them today on testimony. I certainly know a lot of them su su uh, submitted letters of support and maybe couldn't stick around for this hearing as long as they would have liked. But, but um, you know, currently the MTA has no access point to this subway station here. Uh, they don't have any land or landing point to be able to uh, build this uh, uh, elevator. And so for lack of um, our ability to deed this land over to them, they would have no access to the elevator uh, anywhere. And so I think this is really a key to unlocking that ADA accessibility for the station. Okay. Um, and now just a, a, a couple of last questions here. On good paying jobs and local hiring, uh, will, the, will this development have uh, good jobs for the building service workers? Yes, we've signed an agreement with 32BJ already to operate the building. Um, and you know, 32BJ has been gracious enough also to agree to work with our local hiring partners in the neighborhood to try to help to, you know, not only do they have a lot of members in the district, but also to try to source as many local uh, people for new opportunities as possible. Okay. And do you have a plan in place now uh, to ensure local hiring and MWBE participation during construction? Yes, we have as a, um, um, it is a stipulation of our community benefits agreement. And we have been in active discussion already with Brooklyn Workforce Innovations, Opportunities for Better Tomorrow, and a company called Crescent Consulting, who's done a lot of MWBE work across Brooklyn to craft a local hiring program here. Uh, How many local hires would typically be involved in a project like this? So we made a commitment of uh, our goal of 35% participation, right? We have no mandate for any participation within the zoning action. And so we tried to mirror the HPD or, or even go beyond in some cases, the HPD guidelines. Uh, and we arrived at that number in consultation with Fifth Avenue committee and our other CBO partners. Okay. And how can we ensure uh, follow-up and progress reports on these commitments? We have uh, reporting, um, 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 uh, mechanisms, for lack of a better term, outlined in the CBA. Um, and, you know, I know Community Board 7 was not uh, allowed to sign the CBA as a government entity, but we're also happy to, you know, build in regular reporting to Community Board 7 as well. Okay, great. Thank you. And my last question, um, what uh, sustainability and resiliency measures are incorporated into the building's design and construction? Yeah, so we've set targets again within the CBA around everything from green roofs and rain catchment areas, you know, pending agency approval from DEP and DOT and MTA, et cetera, and others, uh, as well as setting targets for green enterprise communities uh, standards from HPD. Okay, thank you very much. Um, that's thank it for you. me. I want to take uh, the opportunity now to uh, turn it over to uh, my colleague, uh, Councilmember Menchaca, for uh, a few questions. Thank you, Chair Moya. Um, and again, thank you for the presentation today. I think we we saw the incredible work from the community really build out a real sense of commitment from the neighborhood to keep this whole process accountable. Now, um, I have a few questions. One is about the CBA. So much rests on the CBA and there's been a lot of work from a series of uh, or local organizations. And so because it's freshly inked, uh, how are you going to get the word out to the community about the components of the CBA? Uh, do you have a plan for outreach and engagement? Thank you, council member, for the question and, and you know, appreciate your guidance and, and, and you know, leadership on this project. I, I you know, as you can imagine, um, we went through a very uh, lengthy, uh, you know, community conversation with the community board. Um, and, you know, the conditions of their approval were, no, were numerous and those were not arrived at kind of, you know, fly by night, but over a, you know, very lengthy process that started long before the, you know, Euler clock began. And, you know, we're fairly confident, um, and I think our community partners would agree, and we'll hear from some of them today, that the, uh, that really kind of represents the exhaustive list of compromises that the building was able to support um, as part of the process. And so, you know, moving from the conditions in the community board report to the borough president report to, you know, working with the four community-based organizations over the last couple of months to craft the document. It's obviously been a lot of work that's been done uh, in a short period of time to, you know, get to the point of a finalized document. We didn't want to walk into this hearing today 
with mm -hmm. notions that, oh, one day we'll have a CBA or one day we'll deal with it. We wanted to really demonstrate to the council and to the community that we took seriously the conditions of the community board findings and, and, and come with a signed document here today, which uh, obviously we're now happy to share. Um, so, you know, the outreach now, I think, would be to, you know, share that document with, with Community Board 7. Um, uh, we did uh, share it with uh, the, uh, the uh, leadership last night, um, as the, the document was only signed a few, uh, two days ago now. Um, but we're happy to uh, engage in a more robust, um, you know, community uh, uh, sharing of that document now. And then I would also add that, you know, the, commu the, the, the CBA adds, has an extensive, um, you know, marketing and, and uh, kind of economic uh, preparation, economic literacy and, and, and um, uh, um, lottery preparation um, process that is outlined uh, within the document. You know, we're still a, a couple of years away, obviously, from um, being an, anyone being able to take occupancy of the building if it was to be approved and built. Um, so we still have a, a long period of time uh, to spread the word about the affordable housing opportunities and get as many community board seven members uh, prepped as possible to take advantage of those opportunities as well. Well, and and before I, I continue on the on the CBA, you mentioned the conditions that were set by the community board. And did you meet all the conditions that were set by the community board? Yes. They approved with conditions. Yes. Okay, so these are all good things to talk about, uh, and and I think what I would I would like to ask if Totem and the especially the CBA uh, signatories can can build a a space where you can at least present to whomever wants to learn more about it uh, that are beyond the initial group that created the CBA. Would you agree to a community conversation, maybe co-hosted by the community board and whomever, uh, to in multiple languages, Mandarin, Spanish, English, uh, really review the items and, and really answer questions about the CBA as part of this process. We'd be happy to arrange a session, uh, hopefully in partnership with CB7 to do just that. Um, obviously, you know, given the timeline and the amount of time that's already gone into the negotiation of the conditions and the CBA, I think it'd be tough to relitigate a bunch of the questions that were decided by the community board and voted affirmatively, obviously in the months past, but in terms of sharing information about, you know, where we've come out. And then if there are suggestions, you know, um, that, that can be incorporated that aren't, you know, uh, you know, it, it totally throwing the baby out with the bathwater in terms of the, you know, um, uh, kind of development program that we've arrived at now, we'd be happy to, to obviously talk about those as well. Yeah, no, I, and I and I agree. And this is this is the the nervousness of engagement uh, when you go out to the community uh, and and you're engaging in a public process. So uh, you've you've fared enough, or I, I should say, you've fared a lot of of um, hot seat uh, protocol in this. So uh, this is just part of it. So um, thank you for that, and we should follow up with everybody to ensure that that you can at least get the information out. Uh, uh, where, where you all landed. It seems like there's a lot of good things that should be talked about. Um, my final two questions are really about uh, that early time when you came to my office to speak to this uh, project and we said, get to 100% affordable. If you remember that, um, I just wanna give an opportunity to talk about the administration. I know that you're touting the fact that there's no public funds uh, in this project uh, but more public funds could have deepened the affordability. And so can you just talk a little bit about the process that we took to ask the administration to join in and help the affordability question? I'm happy to, and then I might ask have my colleague, you know, Jay Marcus to jump in here, who obviously has a, a wealth of experience with HPD. But, um, you know, two years ago when we started this project, you, you know, I recall that conversation quite well, and you did ask for us to strive to get to deeper affordability, right? And and so we went to HPD a number of times and had uh, what I would I would call them, uh, you know, uh, not uh, uh, conversations that were full of, uh, you know, anger or anything, but but just that they're they're kind of off the shelf term sheets for 100% affordable programs uh, did not contemplate land costs as high as Sunset Park. And also further that they did not have they do not have an existing program to kind of bridge the gap between MIH and their 100% affordable programs. 
Um, and I'll ask Jay to talk a little bit more about that. But I will also just mention that, you know, we followed closely the debates in the neighborhood about, you know, the 100% affordable projects that, that preceded us here. Obviously, Fifth Avenue Committee was involved in those, particularly with the Brooklyn Library. And, you know, a lot of the conversation in the neighborhood also had to do with affordable for who, right? And at, at what depth of AMI. And even at the 100%, you know, affordable term sheets out of HPD, you know, many of the kind of income bands that they are, that are offered with that public subsidy, you know, far exceed the AMIs that we were able to achieve here in terms of, you know, uh, ranging from, you know, much higher than 40% of AMI, 60%, 80% of AMI, 100% of AMI, which in this neighborhood would be potentially even exceeding market rate, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, our, we, are, we are forecasting market rate rents here uh, that are very much in keeping uh, with uh, uh, AMIs that are on the affordable scale. Um, but doing so without subsidy and being able to offer that 30 and 40% of AMI that, that, you know, is very, I mean, we can even check with Brooklyn City Plan. We, we're not able to identify another uh, app, private MIH application that's ever achieved this depth of 46% of, uh, of AMI without government subsidy. So I ask Jay to. Right. Uh, no, uh, Council Member, we very much appreciate the suggestion and something We've spoken to the inclusionary unit at HPD uh, and the new construction unit to some degree several times about um, both in terms of how they might review the underwriting and where requirements would go on. Um, if, for example, if there was money like Res A or something that could potentially in the future when the budgets aren't, isn't so tight at HPD and for the city generally be available. So I do think it's a program. We're very anxious to see if we can do it. I think there are a lot of communities where, uh, where the community's objection that a project that's 75% um, market rate does pose some risk of encouraging gentrification. Um, this project I should mention because it's in the Northern part of the district where there was already a day, I don't think really falls into that category, but there are a lot of other communities where that can happen, or let's say as development made with the 7A, uh, zoning further down on Fourth Avenue might start to see some private sector interest. So, I think I hope the council generally will look at that of trying to fashion a program that will enable additional additional affordable units um, to be in MIH projects. and And appreciate that that you've kind of uh, been pushing that idea and concept for a while. But I do think, it, as Tucker mentioned, it likely would require a new program at HPD specifically to make it happen in any sort of larger scale. Well, thank you, Jay, for your work and and Totem, uh, Tucker and Totem team. We didn't get the administration to bite. And so uh, that's an incredible disappointment and uh, just gave us less to work with and tools for affordability, which is a big theme in everyone's eyes. So the last question, uh, Tucker, and this is just one that I think is important to understand because we are in a pandemic now, uh, we're still in it. And you all decided to certify in the middle of the pandemic. And so I just wanna, for the record, uh, ask, and really this is for any developer that is moving forward in the middle of a pandemic, a process, even though it's a public process, it's, it's a pandemic, we're virtual. What compelled you to move through? Uh, and just wanna make sure that you have your voice to answer that question in the middle of a pandemic, uh, an application like this. Thank you, Council Member, for the answer, uh, opportunity to answer that. I mean, I, I, I would answer it in twofold. I mean, one, from a kind of policy perspective and a, and a civic perspective, I mean, you all, you know much better than I do that, that Sunset Park has been hit disproportionately hard by COVID. And, you know, one of the underlying reasons for that, the, you know, the data has been clear is, is because of the immense amount of overcrowding in the district, right, that, that people are forced to live in apartments one, two bedroom apartments, three, four, five people to an apartment. Um, and that, and that, you know, that overcrowding issue that is a combination of the lack of new development that's taken place and the aged building stock in the district has really driven the COVID numbers in the area much higher. And so, you know, that decision to try to help alleviate even in our own small way, right? More housing for the neighborhood at, at, at the time that we could, um, you know, was not taken lightly. I, I would also say, you know, we are not a large developer, right? We're a small landowner. This is one of our first projects. Um, you know, we don't have, you know, 
I have you know, rich parents to go to or deep pockets behind us to make this project work. I mean, we delayed um, the certification process by nearly six months um, um, due to COVID. We were originally supposed to certify last spring and we, wait, we were delayed until the fall. And we simply, you know, also just ran out of time, but we don't have the luxury. Every month that goes by, we're carrying the mortgage there, we're carrying the financial costs. The financial burden was too great for us to wait any further. Uh, and, and also with the impending political timelines hanging out there, we, we simply didn't have any more um, runway uh, to, to wait further. Well, thank you. Um, I look forward to the engagement on the CBA. Uh, that's contingent, I think, on any kind of approval here. So let's get working on that ASAP and uh, looking forward to that. Thank you, thank Chair, for this time. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Machaca. Um, I now want to take the opportunity uh, to invite my colleagues to ask questions. Um, Council, do we have any uh, uh, council members that have any questions uh, for this panel? Okay, I see no members with questions for the panel. Okay, uh, there being no further questions, uh, the applicant panel is excused. Thank you very much for your testimony here today. Uh, Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on the uh, 737 Fourth Avenue rezoning application? Yes, Chair Moyer, there are approximately 44 public witnesses who have signed, signed up to speak. For members of the public who are here to testify, please note again, that witnesses will generally be called in groups of four. When you hear your name, please stand by and prepare to speak when the chair says that you may begin. Please also note that once all panelists in your group have completed their testimony, you will be removed from the meeting as a group uh, and the next group of speakers will be introduced. Once removed, participants may continue to view the live stream broadcast of this hearing at the council's website. We will now hear from the first panel, which will include uh, New York State Assembly Member Marcella Mittains. Time starts now. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, um, my name is Marcella Mittains and I am the Assembly Member for the 51st District. I spent a little over 10 years on the Community Board and I left as the outgoing um, Chair of Housing. Thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to speak. Um, I want to just talk a little bit more about this project. Um, I know that the project as it is sound, uh, sounds like a good project, but we deserve so much better. And now is the time to demand it. Um, I think that we should not be having any hearings um, at a time where we are in a, a global pandemic where folks are fighting for jobs and they're fighting to keep food on, their, on the table for their families. This is not inclusive. This does not allow people uh, an opportunity to participate. Um, and so I really want to stress that at a time where um, we really need to be taking the lead from our community. This is an affordable housing unit that's only going to produce around 35 units. And when you break that down, it's only going to be able to give us 17. At the end of the day, when the jobs are done, there will only be 10 full-time jobs. And this is what this community is going to be fighting for. You're talking about a housing crisis. Well, the way we start attacking it is making sure that we're making units affordable to those that really need it. So 30% sounds good, but what we really need is 20%. And it's great that you've made more larger apartments, but we need to target those families and make sure that the, all the units are for larger apartments. Um, housing production. We cannot build our way out of this crisis. I'm gonna say that again. We cannot build our way out of this crisis. The building has to be something that's long-term. And for us to have more than a hundred people coming in, a hundred families coming in for these apartments to then just in turn only turn over 17 to folks in the community, that's not the way to do it. We know that the MIH program is a failed program. It's purpose is to build mixed income housing. Its purpose is to build market rate housing. So you are on target for that, but that is not what this community needs. Um, the MTA elevator, that's great. What we need is more trains and they need to be more affordable. The community benefits agreement is not enforceable unless you have to take the people to court. 
We don't have time to do that. And the Fifth Avenue Committee knows this very well because they have had to take the Barclays to court to ensure that they follow through with their community benefits agreement. And we're still waiting for all those affordable units years later. I say this because I know a lot of you are gonna be moving on from city council. I know you guys are looking at other opportunities, but we must remember that our first duty is to the people that have elected us. And to right now, it's the working class people that need the most assistance and the most help. So I'm gonna ask you and implore you to really consider this project. This project is gonna be making money for the investor. That's what it is, it's an investment. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. But we cannot afford to allow precedent to be sent for a large development in an area that's specifically zoned against it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Before we move uh, to the next um, panel, I just want to remind uh, the members of the public that you'll be given two minutes to speak. Um, please do not begin until the Sergeant at Arms has started the clock. And now I want to turn it over to our council to call up the first panel. Chair, if there are no questions for this panel, um, we, we could excuse Assembly Member Martinez. I'm sorry. No questions here. And with that, we will take the next panel. The next panel will include Jeremy Kaplan, Elise Shuck, and Jackie Painter. First speaker on the panel will be Jeremy Kaplan, followed by Elise Shuck. Time starts now. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh, okay, thank you so much. So I, I like to say, I, I, good to see you again, Chairman uh, Moya. We, uh, we met under Industry City and I appreciate some of the work that you did during that. Um, I'm just really disappointed that we're back here sort of after we litigated sort of the issues with the Euler process and we had a community board and you know a council member who said that this Euler process was broken and now here we are Sunset Park faced with another broken proposal and another broken Euler process having to deal with this and also just hearing now within minutes of having to testify that we have a signed CBA. I have never heard about the CBA. This CBA was, was brought up just now to me. The community has not been involved in it. And shockingly, it's the same four groups that were involved in the industry city CBA. So we already litigated the issues with the CBA, the way in which they're not enforceable. But I, I think also the, the real thing is that we've been discussing with everybody is that 100 luxury units out of context in this neighborhood for only 17 is not worth it at all. And we know that Tucker Reed and Totem is going to make a lot of money off of this because they bought this land for $14 million and it wasn't zoned for housing. And there's a supermarket that's going to be right across the street from it that's gonna go up for sale as well. And this is gonna be the Pandora's box that will ignite Fourth Avenue with more luxury condos so that we look like Park Slope and so that we're displaced so that a lot of the black and brown people in Sunset Park won't live there anymore. And so I'm incredibly disappointed that Carlos Menchaca is saying that this is a good deal. The community hasn't seen this deal. And Tucker says we can't even look at it, that it's a done deal. And CB7 hasn't even Fire. said anything to us. So this is, this is a sham. I'm sorry. This is really disappointing. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you for your testimony uh, today. The next speaker will be Elise Shuck, who will be followed by Jackie Painter. Time starts now. Hi, everyone. My name is Elise Shuck. Um, thanks for the opportunity to speak. I am very fortunate. I live um, uh, just a 10 minute walk from this site. Um, I'll be speaking extemporaneously, but I am against this rezoning. Um, I'm gonna mention four points. Point number one, the community engagement process that the totem says that they did is actually not in line with, what, with the reality. Um, many local residents did not know that this whole block has been rezoned. Um, point number one. <laughs> point number two, 
the building is completely out of scale with the existing heights on the block. Um, so currently that whole block is three to four stories. It will change the character of the neighborhood. Point number three, it's, it's very unclear to me why the MTA cannot access the site to install an elevator for that 25th street stop. Um, why do we need a real estate developer to make this subway stop ADA compliant? Very unclear to me. And Carlos Menchaca, I know that you're running for mayor. I know that's your, your next plan. <laughs> um, and um, if you agree to, to this rezoning, um, you're basically look at the look at the residents in the in the in the uh, think about the residents who will be displaced. Fourth, the I've lived in Brooklyn for uh, close to 20 years. I've seen rapid displacement in that period of time. If this building goes up, it will continue the rapid displacement that has occurred throughout Brooklyn across the past 20 years. Um, displacement is real. And um, I totally endorse what, what Assembly Member um, Matanis mentioned, as well as uh, Jeremy Kaplan. Um, so, um, Mr. Menchaca, you were brave with the Industry City rezoning. You were able to, to fight that. Um, and I encourage you to vote against this. Sorry. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. The next and last speaker on this panel will be Jackie Painter. Time starts now. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Good to see everyone here. Good to see you, Chair Moya. Uh, my name is Jackie Painter. I'm a community member of Council District 38, mutual aid organizer and city council candidate. I appreciate the attempt of a community-centered approach, but in my opinion, this is a failed attempt. It's not it. As far as I've heard, our community has not even known about this signed CBA and 25% of affordable housing in a one building is just unacceptable right now. One out of four units, it, it's not gonna take us out of the extreme housing crisis that we're in, in a time when so many of our existing neighbors and families are living in housing that has no gas, no heat, no water. We need to be putting our efforts into these families and not into a luxury development that's going to gentrify the neighborhood. This development will make an impact on prices around the area, no matter how hard they try. Um, they won't be able to control the forces of capitalism and the real estate market in the city. This is why 25% affordable housing is too low and the high risks of uncontrollable consequences of this development will hurt existing tenants already struggling to pay rent and some without gas and heat and hot water. Honestly, when are we going to learn our lesson with this? Developers provide a small percentage of affordable housing to build luxury housing. It's, it's a ticket. It sets more of a trend of more luxury and a rapid acceleration of more gentrification and displacement in the neighborhood. I agree with everyone else that just testified and um, Assembly Member Matinas, uh, a bike st a station, an elevator, these are things that we can do without a developer. We can do these things for our community ourselves if the community wants it. Um, this failed formula, it hurts our communities and we need to stop and do better for our families. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie, for your testimony today. Um, Sure, that was the last speaker on this panel. Uh, thank you, this uh, panel now is excused. Thank you so much uh, for being here today and giving us uh, your testimony. Thank you so much. Um, Council, um, can we call up the next panel, please? The next panel will include John Fontillas, Bill Wilkins, Mark Espinosa, and Isaiah Thomas. First speaker will be John Fontillas. Starts now. Hi, this is John Fontilla. This is my voice coming in through. Yep, we can hear you. Okay, thank you, Chair Moya, Committee Council Members, and Council Member Menchaca. My name is John Fontillas, and I am the chair of Land Use Committee of Brooklyn Community Board Seven. 
At our November 18th meeting, the board voted 26 to 15 to approve with conditions the proposed rezoning for 70, 737 Fourth Avenue. The vote concluded an open process of outreach to the uh, Sunset Park community. That included two informational meetings on August 4th and October 5th, and a public hearing on November 12th via Zoom. At each one of these sessions, it was attended by over 75 to approximately 100 community members. I say this to point out, it is rare when a developer engages the board early in the land use process and is open to responding to community concerns. When Totem first came to the board, CB7 had just completed a year long study on increasing affordable housing in Sunset Park. Totem responded favorably, committing to a range of affordability tiers appropriate to the neighborhood, including down to 30% AMI, larger two and three bedroom units to house families, and addressing other community concerns such as green infrastructure, transit improvements, and marketing affordable units to the neighborhood. This project will add 35 new units of permanently affordable housing to Sunset Park. It will also be a precedent for future rezonings in CB7 to meet or exceed the same levels of affordability. Harnessing the private market to provide a fair share of affordable units is an important tool to address the crisis in affordable housing. As in any community, opinion on the project was not monolithic. Some community members believe that any new development, public or private, must be 100% affordable because the crisis is so large. Some believe the MIH program provides too much profit to a developer in exchange for a minimum required number of affordable units. Most critically, some are concerned market rate development displaces lower income families who live nearby, many of them of color who will not find similarly affordable housing in the district. The board agrees racial and ethnic economic disparity factors should be part of the land use analysis of future projects. By providing real data and measurements of social and economic conditions, the community board will have better insight to community impacts and we recommend the council support legislation that will require this as a part of ULER. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. All right, thank you. The next speaker will be Bill Wilkins, followed by Mark Espinosa. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Bill Wilkins. I'm the Director of Economic Development and Housing for the Local Development Corporation of East New York, which gives me a unique perspective in housing development projects. Therefore, without hesitation or reservation, I support the reference land use item. This project represents a bottom-up approach to development by bringing into the account and envelope local stakeholders sensitivity and direct needs to making improvements to their community's housing stock. To this point, 737 Fourth Avenue will dramatically increase the affordable housing stock in Community Board 7 by 30%, which is critical in preserving the ability for local residents to reside in their community long-term, which is paramount. Additionally, the building design and amenities offered are top shelf. Also using union labor ensures the buildings will be built with exacting detail. Uh, to Chairman Moy, house music all night long. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <Bill. laughs> the next speaker is Mark Espinosa, followed by Isaiah Thomas. Time starts now. Good morning, Chair Moya and City Council members. My name is Mark Espinoza and I am a member of 32BJ. I'm here on behalf of my union to express our support for the proposed project at 737 Fourth Avenue in Sunset Park. Over the past year, the COVID-19 pandemic has devastated the city I call home, with so many New Yorkers suffering from the virus and many others losing their jobs. We must put working families and good jobs in the center of our recovery and we can do so through new development projects like the one at 737 Fourth Avenue proposed by a local developer, Totem. The proposed rezoning at 737 Fourth Ave would deliver on ensuring that our neighborhoods can benefit from new development while our workers can sustain a living wage. The permanent good jobs at 737 Fourth Avenue will have a real impact by providing prevailing wages and benefits. 
We estimate that the creation of this development will lead to seven new building service jobs. This project will also require mandatory inclusionary housing to ensure that projects have a minimum number of affordable units. If this project is approved, the community will gain 35 new affordable housing options. We need to have consistent responsible development that brings important benefits. The over 1,032 BJ members who live and work in Brooklyn Community District 7 understand the urgent need for jobs that can lift our neighbors up. We are pleased that Totem has made an early commitment to establishing prevailing wage jobs. The proposed project will provide good jobs, affordable housing, and will give opportunity for upward mobility, security and dignity for working families. And 32BJ supports responsible developers who will continue to uphold the industry standard and provide opportunities for working families to thrive in New York City. On behalf of 32BJ SEIU, I respectfully urge you to approve this project. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for your testimony. The next and last speaker on this panel will be Isaiah Thomas. Time starts now. Thank you for having me. Good afternoon. Um, I'm just testifying in support of the project. Um, the site currently sits as a Dunkin' Donuts, a drive through and a parking lot. Um, I want to show my support for this project because it brings much support to the Brooklyn area. Um, through affordable housing and Brooklyn just in general. The units that will be provided will be permanently affordable and they're targeting a lower um, AMI than which is required, 30%. Um, this project also requires no public subsidy and allows for creation, um, permanent job creation through 32 BJ. And lastly, it also provides an easement for MTA, which they will be able to provide an elevator with getting the land for free. Um, I would just want to commend Totem for just being so open for speaking with the community, getting the feedback and just going back and revising their plan and truly trying to make a truly affordable project. Um, and yeah, I just want to show my support. Thank you. Thank you, as I am. Um, is that the last speaker uh, for the panel? That is the last speaker on this panel. Okay, great. Uh, I want to turn it over quickly to uh, Council Member Menchaca, uh, who has a question for one of the panelists. Council Member. Thank you. I want to thank the panel for, for your testimony uh, and a special thank you to Community Board 7, uh, led by, by John uh, and his incredible uh, members, members on the committee. And so just thank you uh, for all the work that you did on this project. And, and I think what I wanna ask here is uh, there were in previous panels, a discussion about the CBA and it being a freshly you know, created document. Uh, I don't doubt that a lot of work was put into it. Uh, and I asked Totem to build out uh, an engagement plan. And so uh, will, will you support a, a kind of just review uh, just so that people understand what it is, and so people understand that that it happened, and that these are the elements. Uh, I understand that there's no litigation on it, and I get that. But at the very least, we can get everyone to understand it, and that the that the burden is on Totem and any other partners to ensure that it that it's a document that is translated in Chinese and Spanish uh, and English, uh, and that it is communicated. Is that fair? Chair Fontelis? Oh, if you can unmute them, that would be great. You have to un unmute. John. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, just, a, a, just a point of uh, uh, knowledge. I, I am a land use committee chair. Uh, our board chair, Cesar Zuniga, um, I believe is, is has dialed in as well. Uh, but we're absolutely in agreement. We uh, should try as, as much as possible to uh, uh, memorialize the, uh, the agreement that has just come together. Uh, I believe uh, both Chair Zuniga and I were uh, uh, sent the agreement late yesterday. So uh, we ourselves have not gone through it, but we do. We were aware that this was winding its way through. Uh, as the board itself uh, cannot be a party to the, the agreement, we, we understand that we uh, uh, have a, uh, a stakeholder role and an interest in, in seeing it uh, memorialized. Uh, but as you know, council member, we are uh, definitely uh, agree that uh, we should uh, broadcast the elements of this agreement in the, the four 
uh, major languages in our district and make sure that those uh, community members who have an interest in this are made aware of the process. And, and I would like to say that, you know, I, I think in retrospect, um, being able to discuss openly how a developer can work with a board uh, is a benefit, uh, not only to our board, but to all the boards across uh, the city and to really, you know, uh, explore how uh, best practices and, and lessons learned from the process could help uh, improve the process going forward. Well, thank you. And, and, and I think that the CB7 arc of knowledge and understanding and power has, has just been transformational. I think, uh, especially during my time as council member, so I've just been uh, incredibly impressed. And I know there's a lot of resources that uh, we've been able to gather for, um, for this very big work. And so I'll shift over to Mark uh, Espinosa over at 32BJ. And will you also bring resources to ensure that people have an engaged uh, a, a truly engaged process on this uh, this agreement. Will, th th will 32 BJ support uh, with resources, translators, et cetera, whatever is needed? I will have to uh, ask uh, people above me and I'll get back to you. I'll make sure that okay. we get back. Okay, great. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, okay, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Um, there being no more questions for this panel, uh, the witness panel is now excused. Thank you all for your testimony today. Uh, Council, if you can please call up the next panel. The next panel will include Benjamin Margolis, Daniel Libor, Yosef Kessler, and Benjamin Listman. First speaker will be Benjamin Margolis, followed by Daniel Libor. I'm Scott Bell. There's no reminder, everyone, uh, there's uh, two minutes on the clock. So uh, I'm sorry, Sergeant Adams, if we can restart the clock. Once again, my apologies. Okay, Benjamin, whenever you're ready, sorry. Done. No problem. Good afternoon, I'm Ben Margolis, Executive Director of SBIDC, nonprofit supporting industrial employers and their workforce in the Southwest Brooklyn Industrial Business Zone. And from our Workforce One Center at the Brooklyn Army Terminal, We've been based in Sunset Park for over 42 years. The project doesn't fall within the IBZ, but I think Totem's engagement with us speaks to how holistically they're thinking about their investment, that a development an avenue away from the working waterfront still holds impact and opportunity for our industrial community. So in return, we're excited to support the project uh, in two main ways. Uh, one is to employ our workforce team and our employment center to help implement a local hiring and contracting program, which I think can serve as a model for other projects for both construction and permanent jobs. One that directly engages both Sunset Park and Red Hook residents uh, of diverse socioeconomic backgrounds. And two, to work with the developer and other local CBOs in the community on programming the MTA easement space with local entrepreneurs light manufacturers, craftspeople, artists, or nonprofits. Um, we're excited that the developers agree that the rent for this space will be at a rate that's at least 20% below the fair market value. That makes it truly possible that the space can reach the local innovators and makers that we serve. So we are uh, generally supportive and, uh, and, and excited to be part of making this uh, a really fruitful project for Sunset Park. Thank you to, sub to the uh, subcommittee for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Next speaker will be Daniel Libor, followed by Yosef Kessler. Time begins now. Hi, all. I'd like to thank you um, all for your time. And I'd like to thank the committee and the council member really for their diligence and attention to, um, to this rezoning. And um, I'm, I'm here to, uh, in support of the 737 rezoning. I've been really following it since the beginning. It's been kind of interesting. I was originally on the, um, unsure what to think about it. And then as time went on and I've followed it through all the different public hearings, um, seeing how Totem worked with the community, the community board members the, and, the, and, and the council to really provide a project with affordable housing, community engagement, uh, local retail, bike parking, and 
all these different things that the community needs that people don't think to provide. And Totem reached out to the community on multiple different occasions uh, and to get their feedback and, and incorporate it into their design, whether it was removing studios, uh, providing bigger units, lowering the AMI. It's just, it shows really what developers should be doing in today's market to take into consideration the, the neighborhoods that they're developing in. And it's not something that you see from, from for-profit organizations. And it really shows the, uh, the desire for uh, groups to work with the community. And uh, I really think that, that if you look at all the affordable housing that's been done in, in Sunset Park, there's been no real affordable housing provided and Totem is taking a step in the right direction to provide house, much needed housing. And if you look at the population boom that's happening in and around Brooklyn, more developers need to be acting with the same kind of mentality. And I understand people want more and more affordable housing, but there's only so much private developers can do. There's plenty of, pro, uh, of, 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 of empty it's land fun. that the city can use to, uh, to develop 100% affordable housing. And once again, I. I, I want to just uh, strongly support this uh, redevelopment. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for your testimony today. The next speaker will be Joseph Kessler, followed by Benjamin Listman. Hi, my name is Joseph Kessler, uh, and I believe that 737 Fourth Avenue will have many benefits to the community and to the city. The city desperately needs more housing stock, and Sunset Park is no different. Since 2014, 17,000 people have moved to the neighborhood, but only 949 new residential units have been built. This project will bring approximately 135 new units. The community also desperately needs permanent affordable units. This project creates 35, which would represent 30% of the total affordable units built in the entire neighborhood in the last few years. That's 35 families with new affordable homes. This project is taking a Dunkin' Donuts and a parking lot and builds homes for people next to a train station. If we want to break the car culture and prioritize fighting climate change, transforming parking lots to transit-oriented development is precisely the type of development we should be supporting. The development will also build a secure bike parking facility that is free to the community. There are many community members, including essential workers and working cyclists who would greatly benefit from this. Lastly, this project would create good union jobs. I would strongly urge the council to support this application that will provide affordable homes for families and have many other tangible benefits to the community. Thank you. Thank you. The next and last speaker on the panel will be Benjamin Listman. Time begins now. Hi. Um... My name is Ben Listman. Ben Listman, and I, I support the 737 Fourth Avenue application. I'm um, an urban planning student at NYU, um, and um, I support this development because I see that it embodies some of the the best practices in urban planning that um, I love to study. Um, the first it, that I see is transit oriented development, um, dense mixed use development near, near transit sent, near transit creates communities whose primary transportation choices are transit walking and cycling rather than using cars. Um, and this will also be right next to a subway station. Um, again, as, as many people have said, replacing uh, a Dunkin Donuts, which is in necessarily doing much in the way of encouraging um, transportation other than automobiles um, and encouraging cycling. Um, it's going to have the, the uni um, bike parking facility, um, which I think is absolutely wonderful that it's gonna be accessible to the public and not just those living inside the building. Um, and I think obviously the most important part is um, the addition to the new housing stock. Um, with the, the large amount of residents that have moved into the area, 
Um, like Yosef said, since since 2014, it's only led uh, the rents to rise increasingly. Um, really, the only way to attack this is um, is to increase uh, the housing stock, and this is, I think, a step in the right direction. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony, um, Ben. Uh, but before we let the panel go, um, Councilmember Menchaca had a question. Yeah, thank you again to this panel, uh, Ben. Uh, I just want to also ask the same question. Uh, as someone who's been part of the CBA, will you also commit to uh, doing what you can to ensure that the community has uh, is engaged about the components of the CBA? Uh, of course, and always. Uh, very excited to do so. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, There being no more questions uh, for this panel, the witness panel uh, is now excused. Um, Council, can you please call up the next panel? The next panel will include Dr. B.J. Kumar Srivastava, Demetrius Kutumbas, Joshua Weiss, and Shabazz Stewart. First speaker will be Dr. Srivastava, followed by Demetrius Kutumbas. Time begins now. Can we just uh, restart the clock? Yep. Mr. Kutumbas, you must unmute yourself. Yep. Demetrius. Uh, my name is Demetrius, and I'm testifying in support of the rezoning at 737 Fourth Avenue. Biking has been my main mode of transportation for getting around, and I'm looking forward to be able to utilize uh, the future bike parking facility of the development as it will be open to the broader public. Having been a victim of bike theft, it is encouraging to see developments such as this one provide a critical solution to residents and visitors of the neighborhood who depend on cycling as a form of transportation. As probably already mentioned, the existing development with the parking lot and fast food drive through remains underutilized and promotes, prioritizes the use of the automobile while putting endangered pedestrians on the adjacent sidewalk. Building secure bicycle parking is a simple and affordable way to promote bicycle ridership, which will help alleviate the congestion we so often find on our streets and in the subway. New York City has committed to achieving carbon neutrality by 2050, that's in 30 years which requires getting more people out of cars and onto public transit, bikes, and sidewalks. The city, has, the city has to start looking at the transportation system holistically and recognize that in order to properly promote sustainable transportation options, government should not rely on developers such as Totem, but come up with a framework of policies to promote transit-oriented developments such as this one. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Next, we will take Joshua Weiss, who will be followed by Shabazz Stewart. Joshua Weiss. Time begins. Hey, everybody. I the whole subcommittee and uh, Councilman Manchaka. Um, I'll be quick. I'm in class right now, so I'll try my best. I'm chiming in today because this is something that really excites me, this kind of project. Um, I think it really tackles the most important issues our city is facing and specifically Sunset Park and I think that's an increase in housing and I know I've, I've heard uh, from other uh, um, people who have uh, spoken to this issue that uh, they think there's not enough affordable housing I think all how all an increase in housing is an increase in housing and that is something that's very important and Totem has um, has, uh, you know through their numbers that we, we've heard today have uh, um, committed to the affordable housing model as well, 25% or whatever it is. And I just think that's like a very important point to highlight that this, this increase in housing will benefit the community and it is the right direction the city needs. On top of that, I think what this project is doing is taking a parking lot, which is a home essentially for cars and transforming it into a home for people. We need, we need to, to get out of this mindset that uh, uh, around the, the cars and Dunkin' Donuts that we have to start building for, for people. This is gonna be next to a transit station, um, not far from, from a subway. I think it's the R that, that people have uh, said. 
And I think uh, that is also an important point. Uh, people who are commuting to work, this will give families the option to, to be right there um, and uh, have easier commutes. And also the commitment to building a secure bike parking facility that is free to the community is something that shouldn't be overlooked. There are many people who will benefit from this um, now and, and just the shifts that, that we're seeing in New York City and in, um, uh, for, for in, in favor of uh, biking over uh, automobiles and uh, other forms of transit. Um, I think that's also a really important point. And yeah, I can't stress uh, my support um, enough. I think it's, it's super important and yeah, thanks everybody. Thank you, Josh. The next speaker will be Shabazz Stewart, who will be followed by Dr. BJ Kumar Srivastava. Shabazz Stewart. I begins. Hi, uh, my name is Shabazz Stewart. I'm the founder and CEO of UNI. Um, and this project resonates with me on two levels. One is um, the bike parking station. You saw that Tucker teased out um, a facility that we've been working on um, with him and Totem for about uh, seven months. It would be New York City's first such um, indoor facility, um, providing more than 150 secure bike parking spaces to working cyclists into the community at large. We're very excited about that. Um, you know, but as a kid from Brooklyn who spent most of his life in affordable housing, um, watching uh, Brooklyn add what was essentially the population of Pittsburgh over the past 20 years and not seeing affordable housing or market rate housing keep up with that growth. Um, you know, this is the kind of project that we need. This project isn't going to solve the crisis by itself, but it is a small step in the right direction. Um, and we would not have aligned ourselves with the developer of this project if we didn't think it was the right thing to do for the community and for the city at large. And so I urge the community, uh, the council to approve this project and to take the next step in solving the housing crisis. Thank you so much for your consideration for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. The next and last speaker on this panel will be Dr. BJ Kumar Srivastava. Time begins. Dr. Trivastava, if you can hear me, uh, and if you have an unmute request, you need to accept that unmute request in order to begin speaking. Yes, now I have unmuted myself. Okay. Okay. I think there is a great need for affordable housing, and specifically affordable housing that is sustainable development and providing a healthy living environment. For the site under discussion, the changing needs of neighborhood have not been supported. This is unfortunate. This site is not even being used for manufacturing that it is originally zoned for. It has been allowed to languish as a multinational franchisee that does not support neighborhood businesses. This site is unsafe with multiple curve cuts for the drive-through, making it dangerous for seniors and children who should feel safe on the city sidewalks, not to mention the other inappropriate use of the parking lot, which is free. I support the rezoning and development of 737 Fourth Avenue, as it has a potential to provide a safe and beautiful urban design and opportunities for affordable housing to the neighborhood. The proposed project offers a good cross-sectional product where folks in a variety of income bands and age groups from the neighborhood could have access to a transit-oriented building to prevent a new development from becoming a burden on the existing infrastructure. The proposed development should be sustainable design. Apparently, the developer has made that kind of commitment. This development would provide good of connectivity to road, subway, healthcare, education, and other city amenities. We need safe and secure block with local retail and permanently affordable housing. This project checks on all the boxes. My case has this has been to support 
the rezoning and development of 737 Fourth Avenue, and that this I yield the rest of my time. I'm expired. Doctor, thank you for your testimony today. Um, before we excuse the panel, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Council Member Menchaca, uh, who has a question. Yeah, I, think, I wanna thank this panel for, for coming. And uh, I, I don't necessarily recognize you, but that's okay. Um, can you all just say if you're residents of the district or Sunset Park, it'd be just good to get a sense as we write down for follow-ups uh, on, on our side. Uh, I don't know, we can start with Joshua. And maybe we can unmute everyone really quick. Yeah, the, it's not letting us unmute. Um, I'm not a re resident of Sunset Park, no. Okay, I do. thank yeah. you for that. Uh, Dimitri? Yeah, I'm a resident of Manhattan. I visit Brooklyn a lot. I've used the UNI system before, and I feel like with the expansion of the UNI system, I would be visiting this neighborhood more. So I would actually support local businesses through my visits here. Thank you. Uh, and then Dr. Kumar. Okay, well, I don't think, I don't know if he's still on mute. And it, was there anyone else that, that, that testified? And if you're, if you're about to testify in future panels, it would just be good to know if you're a resident, uh, that was for my notes as a, as a city council member representing this district. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, council member Thank you to the panel. Uh, this panel is now excused. Um, there being no more questions, uh, the witness panel is now excused. Uh, Council, can you please call the next panel, please? The next panel will include Maria Roca. Maria Roca will be uh, the next panelist. Time begins. Uh, yes, I. Good, good morning. Well, no, it's not good morning, but um, I, I don't know, like other people have said before, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, great. Yeah. Here we are again. This feels like this, I've been watching the same movie for years now. And um, I, I, I'm besides myself as to why it is that we do this again and again and again, and forget that it didn't work the last time. I'm, other people have covered some of the issues that I was going to cover, so I will just go for the ones. First of all, even though it has been mentioned, remember that we're giving away an opportunity to build truly permanent affordable housing, an entire building. This is to all the government officials that are listening who have their hand on budgets, who have for decades now, have unfortunately many have tried to do something, others have not, to build on a block long site. We are giving away this opportunity for a lousy 17 units of legally uh, affordable housing, so-called affordable housing, to be set aside for community board seven residents, not just Sunset Park. And there's a reason, number two, there's a reason why the zoning allowing taller buildings stops one block north of 737. Has anyone here forgotten what sits east of 737 Fourth Avenue, one block away? It is a nationally recognized and landmark historic site. Has anyone ever bothered to go up or any on this audience? into Greenwood Cemetery and see what this 14 story building would do to the siding. Please, you are speaking out of, I don't know what, it is, nobody knows what they're talking about. Nobody has gone into the, in, into the cemetery. 
what kind of people, what is the money that has been thrown around this neighborhood to shut people up? This building does not belong there. Forget that it is the ugliest thing that many of us, an eight-year-old could have designed a better building, and I know it is a performer and the like. We deserve better than this. There's already a, a seven-story building across the street that has been providing long-term uh, um, rent control, rent stabilized housing. There is a model to be followed, a building that fits into the neighborhood. The supermarket that's land on the supermarket across the street is up for sale because Maria, they see the money Maria, already moving into Please to, don't uh, do this, Carlos. Because, don't uh, leave us with this commit. mess on our hands. Okay. Think so, of who we, we support. Thank you so much, Maria, for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Arthur, can we call up the uh, next panelist? The next panel. Uh, We'll, we'll excuse this panel and the next panel will include Panina Kessler, Joshua Pierre, Aaron Schiffman, and Nathan Rich. The first speaker on the panel will be Panina Kessler, followed by Joshua Pierre. Time begins. Hi, my name is Panina Kessler. I'm a resident of City Council District 35. Um, and a New York City native. I'm here to testify in support of 737 Fourth Avenue. I'm usually highly critical of housing developers because I don't think anyone attending this hearing believes that gentrification is good and has been good for New York City. Um, that being said, as I've learned more about the project, I believe that it could truly be a model for a uh, building affordable housing and improving our communities in the future uh, through the democratization of transit access and focusing on improvements and improving life for the residents who live there. Thank you. The next speaker will be Joshua Pierre, followed by Aaron Schiffman. I begin. Uh, uh, hello, can you guys hear me? I can hear you. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you all for having me. My name is Joshua Pierre. I'm a 23-year-old uh, freelance painter from Brooklyn, New York. I grew up to a single mother who immigrated from Haiti. We lived in constant poverty and often struggled with housing. As a result, I spent time in shelters, group homes, bounced from place to place, and was in the foster care system. This ho housing instability greatly affected my ability to keep a nine-to-five job my performance in school and my overall mental health. A person's home is their foundation and that should never be at risk. This is why I believe an affordable housing project with units of space for people in dire need is crucial. The pandemic made many New Yorkers unemployed and rent in New York City is known to be very expensive, especially for low income families like my own. A one bedroom apartment for six to $700 would be tremendous for someone like me. For my line of work, a stable place to stay is crucial because the majority of my work is done from home. Without adequate studio space, I cannot paint portraits for clients. In closing, I am 100% in support of 737 Fourth Avenue, Totem, and this affordable housing project. And I believe it's a step in the right direction of ending the housing crisis in New York. I yield my time. Thank you, Joshua. Thank you for your testimony today. The next speaker will be Aaron Schiffman, followed by Nathan Rich. Time begins. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Great. Good afternoon. I'm Aaron Schiffman, the Executive Director of Brooklyn Workforce Innovations. BWI is a nonprofit workforce development organization whose mission is to empower low and moderate income people by helping them gain access to living wage employment opportunities and career paths. Our organization supports this rezoning application and is a signatory on the CBA that was mentioned earlier today. Since BWI's founding, we've been able to make it possible for thousands of New Yorkers to start upwardly mobile careers um, that support their families and, and the families of, of, of their neighbors. BWI currently operates seven programs and initiatives and serves more than 800 low-income jobs job seekers each year. For more than five years, we've been developing customized training and local recruitment initiatives to ensure that unemployed neighbors have access to training, employment, and careers associated with local real estate and economic development projects. BWI has been impressed with Totem's commitment 
to engage BWI and other community partners early in their planning for this site and are excited about the workforce potential, both with the construction and with the permanent jobs created at the site. We applaud Totem's commitment to work with 32BJ on the property management jobs, and we hope to be able to join our community partners, SBIDC, and Opportunities for Better Tomorrow and others to connect Sunset Park residents to the construction related positions that the project will bring in time. BWI is excited about Totem's commitment to at least 35% local hiring and contracting to ensure that, so, that Sunset Park residents have access to the employment opportunities that are leveraged through this development. We stand ready to work with Totem to make sure local residents are hired. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. The next and last speaker on this panel will be Nathan Rich. Time begins. Hi everyone, my name is Nathan Rich. I'm a small business owner in the district. I very much appreciate the opportunity to testify in support of this project. Um, I've seen a number of Euler proposals uh, over the past uh, five to 10 years. And I'd like to say that this is an exceptional proposal and that this team has made exceptional efforts to um, meet the needs and the desires of the community, as well as the, uh, the public board. Um, just a couple of the examples, they've already been cited on a number of occasions, but the fact that there are 35 units of affordable housing, not 17, the elimination of studios, as I would note, um, as somebody who works in the building industry, an exceptional uh, thing to do. Studio apartments often are some of the most profitable for builders. Um, and in this case, for the developer to have done that, uh, represents an exceptional effort um, to give over to the MTA, the increase in parking, and of course, above all else, the reduction in the uh, AMI requirements. Um, these represent what I think should, rep should be uh, the future of developer interaction with both the public and the council. Um, I feel like this particular group has really set a precedent. Um, and I would say that I applaud Councilman Menchaca for supporting this. I know uh, he's been a particular critic of developers, but to some of the critics that we've heard today so far, I would say that not all developers are the same. Uh, this is not a luxury developer. Luxury development certainly deserves some criticism in the city and some of the things that we've seen, particularly the last 10 to 20 years, warrant criticism. This represents a unique and I would say precedent setting case. And again, I applaud the city councilman for his support and I'm heartened to hear so much support for the project. It's an exceptional example of what developers or builders can do in this city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Chair, that was the last speaker for this panel. Okay, thank you. Are there uh, any council members um, that have any questions for this? Panel? Chair, I see no members with hands for this. Uh, for questions for this panel. Uh, there being no more questions for this panel, the witness panel is now excused. And council, can you please call up the next panel? The next panel will include Ben Carlos Tiepen, Seth Hill, Daniel Murphy, and Valmond Marlowe. First speaker on the pa uh, panel will be Ben Carlos Tiepen, followed by Seth Hill. Time begins. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ben Carlos Typen, and I'm here to testify in support of the proposed rezoning at 737 Fourth Avenue. When it comes to the rezonings, the discussion is typically dominated by the topic of context, whether it be physical neighborhood context or the demographic context of the neighborhood. The former is silly in the midst of a housing crisis, and therefore my testimony today will focus on the latter. There are people, some of whom have testified here today, who would have you believe that new buildings like the one proposed here are the cause of gentrification. Helpfully, the census tract provides us with a natural experiment to test that hypothesis. If you look at the census data, the number of housing units in the census tract has grown by 0.7%, or just 11 units between 2006 and 2018. So if the people who think new housing is to blame for gentrification are right, one should expect that this anemic housing supply growth would have kept the neighborhood's demographics relatively stable. Nothing could be further from the truth. 
Between 2006 and 2018, the median household income for the census tract has increased by 16% to over $67,000. During the same period, the Latino population has declined by 20%, the white population has increased by 8%, and the median rent has gone up over 12%. These statistics make two things clear. First, affluent people, the type that could afford these market rate units, have been getting displaced into this area for well over a decade and driving up housing costs in, this, in the existing housing stock. And they're going to keep coming. In fact, some of them have testified against this project today for reasons that you're welcome to speculate on. Second, uh, there are hundreds of households that could afford these market rate units in, that already live in this census tract. Between absorbing the demand that's spilling in from the higher income neighborhoods to the north to attracting affluent households that already live here who could, are, who could free up older and cheaper housing stock by moving into this building to the permanent and deeply affordable units that this project would produce, this project is a no-brainer and exactly the type of development we need to see more of if our city is to become as equitable, as sustainable, and inclusive as the values that I think all of you hold. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. Thank you for your um, testimony today. The next speaker will be Seth Hill, followed by Daniel Murphy. Time begins. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Hi, good afternoon. I am Chairman Moore. I am Seth Hill. I'm a local minority certified MBE contractor. And I'd like to commend the developer, totem developer for the project 737 Fourth Avenue. But I think they set the precedence on how things should be done. As I've heard previous speakers mentioned on the panels, they one, they don't have the ADA accessible for the train station. This developer, the applicant, has offered to provide that free of cost. They offered to provide the services with the local 32 BJ, they with community board five. They have tried everything and made a hand forth effort in the commute with everybody socially, monetarily, without subsidies. I think that this type of development and development should set the precedent on what should be done in the community, addressing the need. That's it. They don't have elevator access for the hand, wheelchair and accessible. But these guys are offering to provide that free of cost. They are easement with the MTA. We need developers like that. We can't solve all the housing crisis with one fell swoop. But when you start scrutinizing the developers that come into the community to perform such tasks, then this is the type of precedent totem development is setting. I yield my time. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. You're welcome. The next speaker on the panel will be Daniel Murphy, followed by Valmond Marlowe. Time begins. Hold on, Daniel. We gotta unmute yourself. You gotta unmute yourself. Here we go. Thank hey. you. Thank you, Chairperson and Council members, uh, for the opportunity to speak. I'm testifying today in support of the application for a zoning map amendment to change uh, the eastern side of 4th Avenue uh, from M1D to RHC24, uh, the text amendment and the rezoning for mandatory inclusionary housing. My support is predicated on the several conditions listed out for the developer by Brooklyn Community Board 7, of which I am a member in a resolution to support the application. I am in support of this application for a simple reason. Like every other community district in New York City, though perhaps even more so, Brooklyn Board 7 is in desperate need of more affordable housing. Mandatory inclusionary housing is one of the few tools in the city's land use process that allows for the creation of multiple units of affordable housing as residential property is developed. I wish to stress that MIH is a tool to address and mitigate this, existence, this existential problem for Board 7's families and individuals and not a cure until such a time when we have a more suitable method to address the affordable housing crisis uh, at the scale it requires, we should use this tool and any others within our possession. This includes a survey of any and all publicly owned land, no matter the current use, within or adjacent to Brooklyn Community Board 7, with the goal of developing or converting them into 100% affordable housing. Thank you again for the uh, opportunity to speak. I yield my time. Is that the last panel? Uh, there's one uh, final speaker on this panel, Belmont Marlowe. Time begins. Ugh, I think I got it more or less.
Valmond Marlowe, if you can hear me, uh, if you, in order to speak, you need to accept the unmute request. Bauman Marlowe. I can see a Valmon Marlowe in the participants list. I can see that the microphone is enabled for Valmon Marlowe. Uh, if you can hear us, you have uh, been called to testify on this panel. Chair, please stand by for one moment. Let me see if we uh, have any known technical issues here. Once again, um, for Valmon Marlowe, uh, if you can hear me, you should have been sent an unmute request in order to begin speaking. Uh, and if you have received that unmute request, you need to accept it. And then uh, we can ascertain if we can hear you. Arthur, why don't we come back? To him. Okay. And so that was it for this panel, correct? That was that was the last speaker on this panel. Okay. We can excuse uh, before, uh, the others. Well, before we, we, we excuse the others, uh, I know that Councilmember Menchaca has uh, his hand raised for a question. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, and I'm just reminding everybody who's testifying if they can just mention for the record if they are a resident of Sunset Park. Uh, I know. Uh, the uh, the last speaker, uh, Dan Murphy, is a member of the board. So thank you, and let me have the opportunity right now to say thank you for the work that you've done on the board on this application. Uh, but uh, if Ben Carlos, uh, are you a I, member of, I, I am not. I'm not a resident of Sunset Park, and frankly, I think the the fact that you're asking is quite troubling. And I think you know everyone in the city. As a thank you. I just, I, that's all That's all I wanted. I just want to get a sense for the record if you're a resident of the neighborhood. Thank you. Um, happy to engage with you outside this forum. Uh, are there any other members who testify today? Oh, I'm, I'm a resident of, of uh, Community Board 7 in Sunset Park since March of 1970. So, yeah. Yes. No, I and and I know you. <laughs> all right. Thank uh, you. Are, are there any other folks that testified? That we can unmute and and just to make this easier for the next panel which i think might be the last panel if you can just add to your testimony whether or not you're a resident of sunset park okay thank you thank Council. you are there um there being no more questions for this panel the witness panel is now excused and if we can call up the uh next panel We'll, uh, we'll see if we can get Valmon Marlowe on this next panel, which will also include Peter Mateos, Rodrigo Camarena, and Kenny Guan. The first speaker on the next panel will be Peter Mateos, followed by Rodrigo Camarena. Time begins.
Let's see if we can come back to Peter Mateos and see if we can take Rodrigo Camarena. Rodrigo Camarena. Mark is ready. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for making time. I, uh, my name is Rodrigo Camarena. I am a resident of Sunset Park and I've been a long time community ac activist in this area. I'm also a former member of Community Board 7. And I know the challenges that this community faces around land use and those decisions. I'm also a candidate for city council to, to represent this very district. And I'm here today speaking as a former community uh, chair of a nonprofit located right around the corner from this development. I've been working with this organization for the last 15 years. This block I know very well. And if you know anything about this area, if you aren't someone from around the city that was brought in by the developer to speak favorably about this rezoning, you should know that that area has changed drastically over the last two decades. It's become whiter, it's become wealthier, and it's displaced a lot of black, brown, working class immigrant residents. Right around the corner, there is a development that came up at 724 Fifth Avenue that has raised the prices in the area. Uh, the folks from Fifth Avenue Committee should also know and be aware that the neighbors at 23rd Street, at 229, 225, and 227, 23rd Street are being accosted and uh, bullied by their landlord who sees the trends in the area and knows that property values are rising and needs to kick out current residents that don't pay what the luxury tenants pay around the corner. I know this area well, it's not the solution to affordable housing. It is not the solution to public cycling. I'm a cyclist as well, and I don't support this just because there's bike racks in that area. Um, I'm here today to speak in opposition to this rezoning. This rezoning is based on the failed MIH policy of the de Blasio administration that committed to building 12,000 affordable units in eight years and has only built less than 2,000. That's a failed plan that we're perpetuating by taking it seriously in this rezoning. Um, I, I wanna just finish by saying that, uh, you know, the 17 units that Maria Roca referenced are the 17 units out of the 35 that this community gets to place local residents in. That is not a solution to affordable housing. That is not the solution to the housing no. crisis. I yield my time uh, and I wanna say, please vote this down. This does not reflect our values nor the needs of this community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker on this panel will be Peter Mateos, and then we will try again to have Valmont Barlow. Peter Mateos. Talk is ready. Hello? Yes. Peter. Peter. Hi. Thank you for having me on. Um, I just wanted to voice my support for this project. Um, I'm a Sunset Park born and raised resident, um, still reside there today. Um, and um, I really don't see why there would be any opposition to this project. It's at the end of the day, a Dunkin' Donuts. Um, it's not displacing anybody. It's only creating more housing. Um, and although we may need additional affordable housing units. Um, I don't think that disapproving this project is um, a way of creating that. Uh, we definitely need more housing in this neighborhood. Um, there's, um, you know, it's, it's just, I, I believe it's a step in the right direction. Uh, I think it's gonna add um, retail to pedestrian, retail to the area rather than what exists there today. Um, and overall, just think that it's, it's uh, you know, a uh, step in the right direction. Of course, you know, additional affordable housing would be helpful and, and all that. Um, but again, I think it's a step in the right direction and we need to approve this project and other projects like it to, to start to make a dent in the um, lack of affordable housing, but also just housing in, in the neighborhood. I yield my time. Great, thank you, Peter. Thank you for your uh, testimony today. And just a point, uh, uh, just want to make a quick point. You do not have to be a, uh, a resident of Sunset Park uh, to give testimony here. Uh, folks can give testimony from all parts of the city. Uh, the council member is is asking for um, his own purposes, but this is uh, a, a committee that is open to the public. So everyone 
from all the five boroughs uh, are always allowed to come to these committees uh, and voice uh, your opinions uh, on any projects that come before uh, any one of the committees uh, at the city council. So I just wanted to make that clear. Um, now we can proceed, uh, Arthur. Yes, Chair, we're going to try to uh, get testimony from Valmond Marlowe. Valmond Marlowe. Clock is ready. To the participant whose screen name is Valmond Marlowe, we do see you uh, in the participants list. It appears that your microphone has been enabled. If you can hear us, uh, you're invited to begin your testimony. Okay, it appears we uh, continue to have some sort of issue with Valmond Marlowe. Uh, I believe we do have additional speakers beyond this panel. Okay. Uh, so Chair, if you, yes. unless there are questions, we can excuse this panel. We can try to keep Valmond Marlowe and then Let, we'll take the- uh, Yeah, let's, let's uh, excuse this panel, let's bring up the next panel. At the end, if uh, Marlo is still uh, on the phone, we'll, we'll try to uh, connect. The next panel will include, excuse me. The next panel will include Eduardo Rojas. Eduardo Rojas. Time begins. Hi, Eduardo, can you hear us? Yeah, can you guys hear me? We can hear you cool. whenever you're ready. All right, then. Thank you. So I would just uh, like to request a minute extension as I will be reiterating Totem's proposal so, uh, to ensure Totem that the community members that are in opposition of this project are being active listeners. Uh, I would like to contextualize the way Sunset Park Common Folk are interpreting Totem's 737 rezoning proposal. Totem would like to develop a residential building of which 35% of its total units will be available at affordable rates. But in order for them to do so, they have to submit a rezoning proposal that will permit them to build as needed so that they can both turn a profit and provide some sort of affordable housing to the community through uh, IHP and the guidance of Fifth Avenue Committee, a nonprofit, and I quote, that advances economic and social justice so that we can live and work with dignity and respect while making our community more equitable, sustainable, inclusive, and just. The pro, the Sunset Park community would get access to 17 out of the 35 newly developed affordable housing units of which Totem's one project alone will represent more than 30% increase of all the affordable housing units built in this district over the last six years. In addition, Totem's project will bring approximately 100 jobs or so during the course of construction how these jobs will provide a long-term sustainable living hasn't been specified, but Totem hopes that their project will set a precedent for future development in Sunset Park, thus indirectly creating more jobs down the line, I'm assuming. The con, this proposal is being submitted during a, a pandemic in a community where 31% of households are severely, severely rent burdened back in, that were severely rent, uh, rent burdened back in 2018. And that percentage could have only increased because of the economic downturn caused by a pandemic where community members have limited access to federal aid and affordable and accessible health coverage. And in a community where 75% of housing units are family households, how many families will be displaced due to backed up rent fees, let alone rent increases led by a speculative real estate marketed 
market further perpetuated by new development in the community, such as the uh, proposal. Uh, this is important to note because the affordable housing conversation can no longer stay the same as it was two years ago or six months ago for that matter. While 17 new affordable housing units could Council, do we have any other um, members of the public? We will try one more time to take testimony from Valmond Marlowe. Valmond Marlowe, please accept the unmute request in order to begin speaking. Okay, well, uh, I think we're gonna, we're gonna proceed. But I also wanna remind anyone that um, uh, wasn't able to uh, give testimony for whatever reason, uh, you can always um, email us your testimony at uh, land use uh, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Um, and you can always submit that um, you know, to us and we will um, get it into the record. Thank you, Chair. Uh, if there are any other members of the public tuned in who wish to testify on the 737 4th Avenue rezoning proposal, please press, please press the raise hand button now. We will stand the meeting briefly at ease to confirm that we have no more uh, people signed up. Okay, Chair, it appears that we do not have any other members of the public who wish to testify on this item. Okay, there being no um, members of the public who wish to testify on the uh, 737 Fourth Avenue rezoning proposal under uh, ULIPS number C200029 ZMK and N200030 ZRK. Uh, the public hearing is now closed and this item is laid over. Uh, and I just want to confirm that uh, the votes are completed and uh, have been closed. Yes, Chair. Okay. Well, that concludes uh, today's business. And I would like to thank uh, the members of the public, my colleagues, the subcommittee council and land use and other council staff and the Sergeant at Arms for participating in today's meeting. But before I gavel out, I just wanted to give a big uh, birthday shout out uh, to the one and only uh, John Douglas. Happy birthday, John. Uh, we hope that you're enjoying uh, your special day today and you're uh, somewhere warm. And hopefully that uh, you didn't have to uh, uh, watch this uh, hearing and you got a chance to relax. Uh, we're very thankful for all the great work uh, that you always do uh, here in the Land Use Committee. And uh, I just wanted to uh, wish uh, John a uh, very uh, happy birthday. Thank you, Chair. Uh, apologies, one uh, second. If you would just um, do one last reminder for the email testimony, Chair. Uh, Absolutely. Let me make sure I have it right.
Uh, you can email us uh, your testimony at land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. That's land use council at, uh, sorry, that's land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Are we good? Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you to everybody um, for being uh, here today. And we appreciate the testimony. This meeting is hereby adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>